where to go. Roger. Ready to roll, baby. The lights just went out to your left low. What you saying, lights? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're taking small arms fire at this time. Zero six one nine. We're taking fire to the, the south. They say we're gonna go home. Oh shit! Taking fire to the right. To the left. Right, 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 right. right, right. Oh, we're, getting, we're taking rounds, dude. There! Get out of here, right underneath all this. We're getting hammered, dude. We need the whole ass out of here, brother. Fuck! I'm hit! I'm hit, Mike. Mike, I'm hit. Alright. Break, break. Zero six. One nine has been hit. His front seater has been hit. Charlie died. That's me. Thank you for uh, hosting us at uh, Pickle Tato Podcast. You're one of the first ones that we've. You know, we said at the end of last season that we were going to do some traveling, and we did one that was kind of remote from where we normally do it already, but this is by far the, for, the furthest one we've been to. Um, we'll talk about where where we're at and everything a little bit later. You were asking earlier about um, what was in the box. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, at the beginning of this season, we we counted all of our quarters and pennies in our house, and we made t-shirts, and we're giving them away to all of our guests and we got two different ones. We got a green one and a gray one. So it's got the little pickle potato on the front. Oh, cool. And, of course, the big one on the back. I like it. So you're going to choose whichever one you want. And um, I got all kinds of different sizes okay. in there. And we'll give that to you and choose which one you want at the end of this. Nice. Sound good? Thank you. All right. Yeah, so one of the reasons I want to have you on is because I've known you quite a while. Um, we haven't seen each other in 2004, probably. Yeah, since 2004. And I was talking previously to a guy on the podcast, and we were talking about, you know, friends and a little bit of difference between military friends and other kind of friends. And what's weird about, I've noticed, I'm sure other people have the same feeling about different people, but with my experience, people in the military that I've known, you can pick up a conversation 20 years later and you didn't even know that you've been gone that long. You know what I mean? Sure. It's like, you you know. You just pick up where you left right off. Up. There's no hard feelings about, oh, you didn't text me, or, you know, you haven't called me in years. You know, it's just like, hey, what's up, man? And, that, and that's the end of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, that's what that's what I enjoy. But I've wanted to do this for a while, and I, like I said, I really appreciate you agreeing to this because a lot of people have a little, in, you know, don't want to do it. They don't want to be pried into, which is understandable. But so uh, we really appreciate you doing this. Sure. Um, so we are out in the middle of Mississippi somewhere, which is one of the last places I thought you'd be. So, you did not grow up here, right? No. So, where, where did you grow up at? I grew up in Arkansas. Okay. What yeah. part of Arkansas? Uh, originally started in Conway and then moved later on to a little bitty place called Magnet Cove. Mm -hmm. And that's where I graduated high school from. So, grow, growing up with your parents, still together the whole time? No, no, no. My parents were divorced when I was four. Uh, I had numerous step-parents throughout my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, um, but now the only one I have left living is my mother. Okay. Yeah. So growing up <clears throat> with multiple step parents, was that a pretty rough childhood or normal childhood or, you know, sports, you know, tell me the inside of when you were growing up in that small little town in Arkansas. Uh, definitely not a normal childhood. Yeah. Um, you know, constantly, constantly being pulled between sets of parents sure. and, um, you know, it was one of those deals where the dad had uh, every other weekend visitation, you know, maybe two weeks in the summer, that kind of thing. And then, yeah. you, then you went back to the mom's side. And, of course, they were constantly bickering, you know, as grownups will do over child support mm. and seeing each other and visitation rights and all of that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. it, was, it was nuts. Yeah, I kind of went through something similar. So I kind of understand what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it affected me too growing up. Um, you know, you, <clears throat> there's two things you can do. You can dwell on it, dwell on your how you were growing up and use it as an excuse your whole life. Or at some point you got to grow up and make your decision of, hey, this, this is not the environment that I want to be in the rest of my life. Yeah. So in high school, I mean, was you a good student? Do you have aspirations to go to college or? Uh, <laughs> it's a funny story. I was uh, I was a decent student. I was a, a BC student, you know, and uh, I played football, uh, ran track, those kind of things. 
but my ultimate, I had my whole life planned out when I was in high school because, you know, you're a high school kid, you think you know everything. Mm -hmm. So my aspiration was to go to the Air Force Academy, uh, learn how to fly jets, I want, you know, and then retire out of the Air Force and then go on and fly, you know, um, airlines and then retire from that and be set for the rest of my life. What would give you an aspiration like that, being that young? Because I'm just going from my own experience, me being in high school, I had no clue what I was going to do. And you already knew about the Air Force and flying and everything. I mean, that was the, I, to me, back then, that was so unreachable to me that I, it wasn't even a thought. We gave you that confidence or even even the forethought to even think about <laughs> doing something like that and being, being able to achieve it, let alone now, you know? I just always thought growing up that there wasn't anything that I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you watch movies. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of books about the Korean War and the, the F-86 Sabre jet and, you know, the Hollywood image of that, that kind of stuff. And it, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to fly something fast. Well, that sounds to be a very confident person. And we just talked about your background. Like I said, I'm just drawing from personal experience here. Confidence was the last thing I had mm -hmm. growing up in your sermon. <laughs> so I think it's fascinating that you had that, like I said, confidence and everything to even be able to pursue something like that. Well. Did, was there anybody that was helping you, giving you steering? You, hey, if you want to do this, you got to do that. Or, well, there was somebody that helped me in a, in a negative way that turned out to be a positive way. And uh, that was my stepfather. Uh, he always told me that I was never going to amount to anything, mm. you know, that I didn't have what it took to even succeed in life. And um, that kind of spurred me to, you know, I'm going to show you, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this stuff. So mm. that was, that was a big motivator. Yeah. Okay. So I can draw from that. <laughs> that happened, that the same thing happened to me, but it was a lot later in life. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So with the, I know a little bit of your background, so I know you didn't go to the Air Force. So, so <laughs> where do, where do we step off? Well, um, I did apply to go to the Air Force Academy, but they sent me a very nice, polite note that said I just didn't meet that standard. <laughs> right. So, uh, did they say what part of the standard you didn't meet? No, they really didn't. But I I, I think it was academic because, mm -hmm. like I said, I you know I was well, that's a pretty good, pretty competitive guy. too. Yeah. yeah. Being that, you got to have like straight A four point and all that kind of exactly, crap. Yeah. and and I didn't have that. I had the I had the willingness and the want to, but I didn't have the academic no. stuff behind me to do it. Mm. So, so if you didn't do that out of high school, you said I asked you about college, and you kind of laughed, and then you were telling the story, but we didn't get to the part where okay, therefore said no. Where do we go from where do we go from well, here? Uh, that was a. 16, 17, what, 18 year old, 17 year old kid working at Walmart in the toy department. Uh, my parents were not, we were uh, lower middle class and they didn't have the money to send me to college. I didn't have the money to go to college. Grades weren't good enough to get a scholarship. Sports, I definitely wasn't good enough to get a scholarship because I was a little bitty guy at the time. And um, so I started looking. You know, I couldn't get in the Air Force. I thought, well, maybe I'll go in the Army. I uh, went and talked to the recruiter, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, I got just a job for you. Um, he said, you could be an air traffic controller with your grades. I, my ASVAB score or whatever, I don't know, don't remember what it was. But so he put me on a bus. I went to Little Rock, went up there. I guess it's called the MEP station. And... Uh, Got up there and uh, sat down with the recruiter and said, yep, you, you know, my recruiter back home said, uh, you know, that could be an air traffic controller. And he said, well, I'm sorry. He said, we don't have any air traffic control slots. Said, but I tell you what I can do for you. He said, I can make you a crew chief on a CH-47 Chinook. I didn't know what that was. Of course, I looked it up. And uh, he said, and you'll get a bonus for signing up. I said, baby, sign me up. <laughs> yeah. So he did. And I did a, the contract and all that stuff and went back home. And my dad was working like a, I don't know, a four to midnight shift out at um, that aluminum, at a Reynolds Aluminum Company. He was a mechanic on those big old diesel dump trucks and mm. that kind of stuff. No. 
he came in. Of course, he was tired and covered with grease. And he said, how'd it go today? And I said, well, here's what happened. I explained it to him. That took me about an hour. So now it's about 1 o'clock in the morning. And I told him I wasn't going to be an air traffic controller. And uh, he went back then. We had, remember the old corded telephone oh, yeah. rotary dial? Absolutely, yeah. In the kitchen with the sure. long cord. Yeah, the 20-foot cord. You better believe it. <laughs> he went over to that phone. He said, what's your recruiter's phone number? Oh, this was at 1 o'clock in the morning. It was 1 o'clock in the okay. morning. I handed him the card from the recruiter. He started dialing. <laughs> I guess the recruiter answered the phone. And he said, uh, listen. So this is Chuck Dodd. He said, you got my boy up there, and you fucked him over. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll send him in the Marines before I let you screw him over like this. And I'm back there going, oh, my God, I'm going in the Marines. <laughs> so they talked for a while, and he said it would, the recruiter, I guess, told Dad that he'd get in touch with him another day or two. And so they are two well, can, I, can I hit a pause on there real sure. quick? So... <clears throat> Your dad, Cohen, I mean, he had to have some kind of familiarity with military and how it worked because none of my family really did. So if I would have told my, some of my family, I'm like, oh, okay. So he, what, how did he know that you were getting screwed? Why did he not think that that was a better thing? My dad was a Marine. Ah, okay. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. Now. Yeah. <laughs> he served in Vietnam. Gotcha. He, okay. he was a Marine. So he knew. Yeah. And, uh, like I said, a couple of days passed, and that same recruiter called and said, "Look, we got another, we got another uh, date for him to go back up to the map station and get the job he wants." And uh, so I did, and it was funny. I sat down with that same recruiter behind that same computer. I thought you didn't have a slot, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And he said, "Oh, we got six slots. Yeah, <laughs> what do you want to do?" And uh, I said, "Well." He said, you can be a tower controller, you can be a radar controller. And I said, well, I'd like to do a radar controller. And uh, signed me up. I left for basic training five days after my 18th birthday. And I went to basic training at Fort McClellan, which is closed now. Um, and then I went to AIT at Rucker mm -hmm. and learned how to be a radar air traffic controller with dreams of going to an airfield, sitting in a dark room behind a radar screen, controlling traffic. Mm -hmm. Left out of uh, Fort Rucker, went to Fort Bragg. Showed up at Fort Bragg, got my little orientation, looked around. I didn't see an airfield. I didn't see any radar facilities, but I saw a whole lot of trucks, mm -hmm. a whole lot of deuce and halves. Back then we had Jeeps. A lot of people walking with packs on their back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so come to find out, I was going to be a tactical air traffic controller. Mm. So they take this radar van, they set it on a five ton or a deuce and a half. I think back then we just had deuce and halves. You go out in the field and you set up this grass runway and set up an approach in case these guys, in case the weather got bad, then they had radar into this field somewhere. Mm. And, uh, we didn't get to do that very often. And the pilots wouldn't talk to us anyway because it was normally good weather when they were flying, so they wouldn't want to do the radar approach. So I did that for a while. So be down in the middle of a field, is that just a, a helo pad that you're looking in to come in, or is that like a full runway where you can bring fixed wing into it also? Either. We, could, we, we could go. Back then, the Army was big on airfield takedowns. Mm -hmm. So we could go to an already established airfield gotcha. that we had bombed or something. Okay. and set up a radar approach to it, or we could set up a radar approach to an opening in the field. It didn't matter. Okay. Um, but I didn't get to do a whole lot of that. But what I did get to do, we were the only air traffic control unit in the Army that had an airborne platoon. And uh, I was pretty gung-ho back then. And so I wanted to go to airborne school. I wanted to get in that platoon. So I did. Went to airborne school. Got in that platoon, went to air assault school a little later. Then I went to Recondo school after that, which is basically, Recondo back then was a kind of a pre-RIP, pre-Ranger course. But you couldn't go to a Ranger battalion because they didn't have air traffic controllers in Ranger battalions. So why in the world would they send you to Ranger school? Right. Right? It didn't make sense. 
but they would let you go to the pre-course. So I did that. And so then what I was doing is I, like I said, we were practicing on airfield takedown. So I would jump out of a airplane with a bunch of radios and batteries on my back and whatever else I could carry to sustain me for however we were going to be there. And uh, I would be attached to a ground unit and we'd set up a very uh, small helipad, if you will, or whatever, and just control the traffic in and out. Because what they'd normally do is they'd drop a big battalion, like a battalion or a brigade of troops on an airfield, and then they would move them somewhere else after they'd taken the airfield. But they had to, you had to have control of the, the aircraft coming in and yeah. out of there. So have you met your wife at this point? Uh, uh, no. Okay. Well, I met her later on in that, in that, uh, while I was in that same unit, she was a tower controller, uh, but she was working in the admin office because uh, it's sexist, but in the army back then, if you had a female that could type, then she was going to go work with the first sergeant or the sergeant major or whatever, because they could type all the forms no. that were constantly needed. So she was doing that, and uh, that's how I met her. You didn't have computers back then? Not many. <laughs> how old are you? No, I'm just kidding. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you, well, that's a total different, how would you meet her? I mean, was you in the same unit? Because yeah. that's, okay. Yeah, we so were in the same unit. So she was working in the first sergeant's office, okay. commander's office. And somehow I always had some kind of paperwork that had to be accomplished. So yeah. I was always having to go mm. to that office. Was it that or you just made up paperwork <laughs> so you can go meet her? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, I had all this paperwork. Yeah. And she couldn't stand me when I first met her. Well, I can, and she'll tell you that. I can understand that. Uh, <laughs> I was pretty arrogant. I was, you know, I was a, I was a paratrooper. I thought I was a badass. Yeah. And, you know, and I was just a man. And, mm. and it showed. <laughs> right. But somehow I wore her down and, and we ended persistence. up. Persistence. Persistence. There you go. We ended up getting married in 1987. Mm. Yeah. So how did you find out? Well, you probably, being in the Army, I didn't find out. I was in the Marine Corps when I came into the Army. So I didn't know about the programs that they had. So, but you being in the Army, you probably heard all about the different programs that the Army had out there to be able to excel your career. At what point did you learn about the waft program or was that something that you knew from day one or, or is it something you heard from somebody how, how did you even learn about being a become a warrant officer to go well, do what we were doing it wasn't so much to become a warrant officer um i just wanted to fly sure i never gave up the dream of wanting to fly mm. and i got stationed in korea and uh had a had a huey come in to a pad that i had set up and drop off a general and the guy needed to reposition the Huey to another place, not far away. And he said, do you got anybody up there that wants to take a ride? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And so I ran down there where he was, and he already had the aircraft running. I got in the aircraft and put the helmet on, and he gave me a quick little brief and picked the aircraft up to a hover and said, okay, you can fly it now. <laughs> oh, he put you in the seat. Put me in oh, the I seat. I thought he meant he put you in the back. No, put oh, wow. me in the seat, and uh, I was hooked. And, yeah, I but mean, it was it was on like Donkey Kong after mm. that, and I had to figure. And he was a warrant officer. He was W four, and uh, so I had to figure out how in the world I was going to get to flight school. And so I started looking at it, and I heard about this thing called a warrant officer, but I also heard about this thing or knew about you know lieutenants, and. Um, we had one lieutenant in our unit that was Huey qualified and he would, he was platoon leader and he, he would go off to go fly during the day and you'd never see him. And I thought, well, maybe that's the way to go. So I talked to him a little bit and talked to some other people and they're like, no, you don't want to go that way. If you want to fly, he said, you need to go to flight school. You need to go to the warrant route. And so, um, I, by then I was an E6, I was averaging a stripe a year. I mean, I was a fast mover. And, uh, but then when I got to E6, there were no E7 slots available and E7s were just stagnant. Mm -hmm. It was going to be years before I got promoted to E7. And, uh, so I said, well, I'll just go put in my flight packet. And I went and took the flight aptitude test and did all the, you know, the physical and all that stuff that you got to do, wrote my 
resume letter, if you want to call it that, and got accepted. And uh, so, did you have to have a flight physical being a radar controller? Yes. Okay, so yeah. you're familiar with the. F okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. I had a my first experience was was a good one. I'm just, I'll tell you what my experience was and see if you had something similar. <laughs> Probably not. So, I, you know, I was in the Marine Corps before I put my application in. Well, it took me years, multiple times getting this application together for deployments and just one thing after another. And one part of it was I was at Lejeune and a part of the application, you had to have a flight physical from an Army doctor. And the Army doctors around Camp Lejeune brag, but tried to find some time to get away from work to actually go up there. It's just... Wasn't happening. So when I got stationed in Hawaii, of course, you know, I got Hunter, I think it's called Hunter now. Hunter Schof Army Airfield. Schofield Barracks. Well, Schofield's where the, you know. The, yeah, I think you're right. But then the airfield's Hunter, I think. It's right It's right next to Schofield. So one of my buddies in the Marine Corps was dating some Army girl up there who happened to be at Hunter. <laughs> so she she hooked me up. and Anyway, Got the, got a, you had to have a warrant officer interview. You yep. didn't write you. Yep. You know, so they did that. And they also, he gave me the phone number to get scheduled with this doc. So I'm thinking, I've had physical. I went to MAPS. I know what a physical is. So I go up there and <clears throat> I'm getting this physical. And they give me this, you know, this stack of papers like this. I'm like, what in the, <laughs> what in the hell is this shit? So yeah, as you, as you know, I'm not telling you th anything you don't know, but you had to go, you know, each station, this guy for the eyes, this guy's for your joints, this guy for this, you know, you had to go all, all these different stations throughout the whole thing that they had there so which lasted all day i mean i actually went to lunch and came back and so one of the last things i you go to is you go to the doctor and you get all the papers that you did all day and you bring it to him and he looks through them and he says yes or no or whatever and um so i'm sitting there and he's going through all my papers hey look everything looks good you know blah blah blah. you know we're gonna send this off the record you know they'll get a stamp i'm like all right cool and uh, he's like there's just one last thing we gotta do and i'm like Man, what else could there be, you know? He's, <laughs> he's like, we had to do a prostate exam. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm 24. I don't even know how old I was. I mean, I was mid-20s, something like that. <laughs> and I'm like, really? I thought he was messing with me, you know? And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, we got, you know, this is what we got to do. So, you know, of course, being that young, you know, pretty embarrassing. Wasn't used to anything like that. So, you know, pull, you know, pull your pants down and, a doc comes behind me and uh, he puts his hand, his left hand on my shoulder, and I'm kind of like bend over on the little thing. And then, uh, you know, he sticks his finger up your ass. And then all of a sudden, this other hand comes on this arm. So I got two hands and it took a second, <laughs> but I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like looking over. <laughs> so he gets done and he's laughing his ass off. And I'm like very irate. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't show it because, you know, being an you know, enlisted guy, you know, in the Marine Corps, you know, listen, officer, there's a, yeah, it's a lot different than in the Army. But I was pissed. And he starts laughing. He's like, oh, don't worry. We do that to all the Marines that come in here. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Real funny. Yeah. So that was, did you have any kind of a flight physical like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there for a while, they were doing that every year. Every year, you got a prostate exam. Mm -hmm. And then after a little while, they cut it back. Yeah. It's like once every three years. I think something. it was. Wasn't it 30 or 40? It may have been. There may have been an age to it. I don't yeah, remember. I think it was an age. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, you got you applied to flight school. Yep. How did it feel when you got the word that you got accepted? I'm I sure. Was a, I was elated. So, I bet you uh, your wife paid more attention to you. Then she's like, oh. Aviator. <laughs> but you guys were together at that point before yeah, then? Yeah. yeah. We were okay. married. Oh, okay. And I was actually stationed at Rucker when I actually found out. Okay. And, uh. So, uh, you know, I just packed my stuff and drove over to the walk barracks. That was back when we were in the World War II, mm -hmm. two-story white buildings for Walk D. Went through Walk D, and, you know, it's like basic training all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, did that. And then once I got out of Walk D, you still wasn't, a, you're still a warrant officer candidate. You weren't a warrant officer like it is today. And they, because they always held that over your head, you know, that if you fell out of flight school, you're not going to be a warrant officer. And um, went to the flight line. And I remember the first day of the flight line, the flight commander stood up and he said, how many of you guys are 18? And the majority of the class raised their hand. So how many of you guys are 25? A few hands. 
How many of you guys are older than 25? Me. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you 18-year-olds? He said, you guys are going to hover about day three. He said, you older guys looking at me? <laughs> he said, it's going to take you a while. He said, whether you realize it or not, you've already started to lose some of your hand-eye coordination, and it's going to be tough on you. So I get paired up with a National Guard guy, my stick buddy. He's 18. Yeah. Day three, he's hovering. And, you know, that was a big deal. Everybody would get off the sure. bus at the at the flight line. The other day, hey, did you hover today? Did you hover? Me? Nope. Couldn't keep it in a cow pasture. This went on for a week. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I, I started to doubt it. And it's about day seven, you know. I actually <laughs> figured it out. That's pretty well, So yeah. we say day seven. How many, what hour mark was that? Uh, it was probably... I think we were flying 1.5 yeah. a day. Okay. So somewhere 10, 12 hours, you yeah. know, something like that. Took that long to get that, just get that part together. Well, that's the hardest part. Yeah. I mean, flying a circle around a traffic pattern is right. pretty easy, but keeping that thing in <laughs> right. one spot, it's a little bit, especially in those, what, what aircraft was you flying back then? UH-1H. Okay. In flight school. Yep. In okay. flight school. We learned on the Huey flying out of Lowe's. And, of course, you get through primary. So, what are they, what are they flying now? I know they got rid of the, the bells. Are they flying LUHs? And, I think they are. In primary? I think so. It's a dual engine aircraft. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it was. Because in that single engine aircraft, you know, you'd be out there just gazing around at the trees, flying, and all of a sudden, doo, mm -hmm. engine failure. What you going to do now? Yep. You know, that kind of thing. And you had to... We were doing touchdown autos. We were mm -hmm. doing touchdown 180 autos. We were doing uh, fixed pitch tail rotor malfunctions. Uh, I don't know if we did OG engine failures or not. I can't remember. But, you know, all the stuff that goes with that. And then once you thought you had that down and you took your primary check ride, then it was on the instruments. Mm -hmm. And instruments was a bear. I remember the first time I <clears throat> flew in, in, in flight school. I definitely wasn't ready because I thought it was going to be like a little flight. He was going to take us out, you know, like orientation thing. Hey, there, here's where the airfield is. Man, we take off. You have the controls. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, nee, you know, up and down. And I, I, that's one thing I would have wanted wanted to do before I retire is, is fly primary again. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I wasn't IP there at the, at the schoolhouse for Apaches, but I think primary would have been pretty fun. I think it would have been too. Yeah. I had an IP that was... Any other day, I could tell you his name, but uh, he was a monster. And uh, But he was good. He mm -hmm. knew how to teach. And he started with me. Now with George, my stick buddy, it's funny, I can remember his name. He just gave him the aircraft and let him fly it. With me, he'd give me one control at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, and he'd say, okay, you master this control. Here's, take the pedals. Keep the nose pointing in this direction. All right, good. All right. Take the collective. Keep it at this altitude. And then lastly, he'd give me a cyclic. He said, now keep it one place, you know. And uh, now hold on. That's right. <laughs> hold on. Yeah. So your first duty assignment coming out of Rucker, out of flight school work? Well, I went, there's a story there too. Um, so we, we got done with flight school, right, and I tracked scouts. So I went on to fly OH 58 off Charlie's. And um, so then we were looking for what advanced aircraft we were going to get. And I really wasn't thinking Apache, but just like everybody else, I was like, man, I'll stay in Hughes, do the party track and get out of here, you know? But they had Blackhawks, Chinooks, Apaches, and a few Huey transitions. And, uh, but I had my little brother living with me at the time. And he was, man, I want to say it was, it was like January, February when we were looking at our advanced aircraft and he needed to stay, uh, in that area to finish school. This was his senior year. Mm. And I was trying to figure out how in the world I could keep from PCS and, and keep him in school and get him through high school. And cause he had, he had a rough childhood as well. And, uh, so really about the only thing I could do was get an Apache transition because it was the longest transition. And, uh, that way I could keep him in school. So maybe for all the wrong reasons, but, that's why I chose Apaches. And we had 
I was, I think I was top three in my class. So I got to pick and I went ahead and picked Apaches. And I'm glad I did. Yeah, I was thought I was when I was going through flight school, everybody wanted Blackhawks, you know. Yeah. And from before I even put on my flight packet, no one was there, you know. I never saw an Apache, but I saw in the videos and pictures and stuff like that. I mean, before I even put my package in, uh, Apaches was what I was going to fly, mm. you know. I'm like, if I get my pick, that's what I'm doing. <clears throat> you know, go through all that stuff. And it, and then come to find out, you know, everybody wants Blackhawks or Snooks, and I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you people? Right. <laughs> you know, I, I just I never understood it. I mean, luckily, it didn't make a difference. I mean, I think I was number three or four in my class. So I mean, it, it wasn't an issue, and it wouldn't have been an issue if I would have been last because nobody wanted, <laughs> nobody wanted them. Yeah, and the reason was nobody wanted them is because you're in the field all the time. Well, we back, were always, back then. We were always told that, or what. The rumor was in my flight school it was, was broke all the time. It was broke all the time. Yeah. You never got to fly it, right. but which was true at, at some point in Apache's life. There was some issues at the beginning. Right. But I will tell you that when I went to my first unit, I think I flew more than any Blackhawk guy I ever flew. Yeah. And back then, in the units, you had you had uh, a company of you, you had three companies of uh, uh, of helicopters, but within that company. You had, I can't remember if it was six Apaches, three OH-58s, and a Blackhawk or something like that. Mm. It was mixed like that. We, we weren't pure like like we were like we are now, I guess, still. And those Blackhawk guys didn't fly that much. And the guys who flew the most were the 58 guys, mm -hmm. you know, but the Apache guys flew quite a bit. Cheaper to fly them things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yep. But boy, they sure regretted it when we got to Iraq, though. <laughs> yeah. I, I ran a couple of my flight buddies over there. Hey, man, can I sit in your aircraft? Nope. Nope. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I went to is because there's air conditioning. Yeah. Um, you know, they want to get cooled off and they got, you know, all their gear on, got freaking plates and everything flying around, just dripping with sweat. Yeah. I wouldn't even give them a second in there. I'm like, nope. <laughs> well, I mean. You can look at it. Yeah. Might let you touch it. This may, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you chose Apache. So your Apache, so you left Rucker. So yeah. I guess your brother got graduated by he the did. time you left. Okay. Yep. Where did he go after that? He went back home to Mama. Okay. And then he ended up going to college. Okay. And well, that's I, good that you could help him out. I mean, yeah. it sounds like you helped him out. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Cool. So you left Rucker and went where? When I left out of flight school, I went to Germany. Germany was my first assignment. Ill assignment. Okay. I was with the 4th 229th Flying Tigers to start with before they deactivated the unit. So what's unique about flying over there in Germany compared to over here? There's a lot more rules. Yeah. And so you got ICAO rules. Yeah. A lot of rules and uh, just a lot of local rules for overflying places and that kind of thing. And then the weather. If the biggest thing there was the weather. And it was horrible. Mm-hmm. It stayed horrible, except yeah. for about three months out of the summer. So your first time that was I mean, I remember when and we'll get to the, when me and you were together there at Illusheim. <clears throat> but the first time that you were there, <laughs> was it the same as my experience? Was you there like in the spring, summertime? Um, let's see. When did I get there? I think so, because all my RL progression was fantastic weather. Okay. Uh, so Illusheim is... An airfield in the middle of farm area. Yep. And by farm area, I don't mean corn and <laughs> stuff like that. It's basically pigs. Mm -hmm. And over there, you know, the weather is so mild most of the time that they don't they didn't have air conditioning. Nope. And and you know the whether you're in the, in the BQs or you know whether you're in the regular housing. So if you didn't have air conditioning, if it was a little warm, you wouldn't open up your windows. To get the breeze going through, well, you know, at some point, they got to put pig shit somewhere. <laughs> so they take these huge tractor fulls of shit and they decide, you know, to spread them all over the fields. And no matter which direction the wind was blowing, it always come to on the time at some point. Yep. And they got to the point where it was like you were actually eating that stuff. I mean, you could taste it. And it there was, was nothing. Nasty. It was even if you close the windows, which made it a little bit better, you can still smell it pretty strongly. So you just might as well leave the windows open and not die of sweat, right? And just eat the eat the pig shit. So was that the same thing 
the first time you were there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I didn't know if it had been... It didn't change that much from the first time I was there to the next time I went. Yeah. Okay. No, no, not at all. So you are there for three years? Did you go anywhere from... I mean, like at the point, did you go to Poland or anything opposite you did from... I think I went to France a couple of times and okay. did a static display. Um, we did go to... Uh, it was a air defense um, post in France that we used to go up to, and we they actually had uh, ZSU twenty three fours, and we would uh, you know fight against them using our APR thirty nines and see what they you know what their radar signature looked like and that kind of stuff. Did you ever chop off a pinvis while you were doing it? I didn't. <laughs> no, uh, that was funny. Yeah. Not one, but two. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so all those of you in the community know what we're talking about. But there's a maneuver that you do if if you don't do it correctly. Um, you can push the nose over so far that the blades will come down and, and the sight that's on the front of the helicopter. You can actually take that thing off the aircraft. Yes. Just by flying. Yeah. And so we know a guy that did it not only once, but twice. And <laughs> one of them that I know of was there in Germany. I don't know if the other one was or not. I don't remember, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I remember, the, I remember the time I was there. Yeah. Matter of fact, I was right behind him. Were you? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so back to you. Um, yeah, so you did a Pol or Poland thing? Not yeah. Poland. Well, it was... was it ZSUs, but where was that at? That was in France. And France, I can't, okay. I can't remember uh, where it was. Okay. But we, like, deployed as a unit, you know, we were. it was a field problem, and... You did everything, you know. And, but we were focused back then on the Russians and deep attack. You know, we didn't do this team of two like we did in Iraq and mm -hmm. Afghanistan. It was so everything was like a basically whole battalion. Fly up, get behind a mountain, pop up, shoot, come back down, and go back to where you're. Uh, at. That's right. And so that was the army's tactic for many, 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 many years. Yes, sir. And that's the way that you were trained all the time. That's what we're going to do. And basically, that type of training was, you know, you're you're, you're facing facing Russia and all their tanks are going to come across, and we have to know how to fight these large hordes of tanks. Right. And that's what we trained to. And we had first generation FLIR. Yeah, which, you know, the, you, you call it first, second gen, third gen. So, you know, there's different generations, but it's, you have to remember the generation is, when they say first gen, it isn't the first generation of of a FLIR only, okay, you could have, we're like on our third or fourth generation. Well, there's other ones that's on their seventh or eighth gen. Not that it's any more advanced, it's just a different nomenclature as you upgrade that particular right. system. Right. So, but uh, being the first generation in Apache was like a a green snowy <laughs> fog. Yeah, it's just, just like a blob. <laughs> right. Yeah. A green blob. Couldn't make out anything really. Yeah. And so flying in that kind, of, that kind of weather over there, I mean, did that help at all? In Germany, as far as like during the winter and stuff like that, I, I think it it made us better pilots yeah. for sure. Uh, we we all I, I made PC over there, and I did enough stuff to scare me to death mm. to learn without killing myself. Yeah, you know, and the wires were horrible over there. They were huge, and uh, they were hard to see because they would paint. Uh, you know, the Germans are pretty. Um, environmentally aware and they didn't want their environment their beautiful landscape so they'd paint those wire stanchions green yeah. and they'd fit right in with the background mm -hmm. you know? yeah if you didn't have those things marked on your maps and yeah yeah so I guess you were alpha models back then it was alpha models so we, you had the fiddles and you didn't have no moving a map or nothing like that nothing we had a doppler Mm -hmm. um, some of us had, and that was what was kind of weird about the aircraft. Some of us had the new, the new Doppler, uh, and then some of us had the old Doppler. And we had a had a thing, a, a book of maps. I want to say it was fifty maps, uh, and I, I may be wrong, but the map book was this thick, mm -hmm. you know. And you had a watch and a pencil mm -hmm. and a route drawn on a map with tick marks on it and you were constantly referring to the clock and the map and you better know where you were. Mm -hmm. And that was a hard transition to get away from, from alpha to D models. Cause even, you know, 
flying D models, a lot of D, D model instructor pilots that were, 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 were still pounding that in your head as, you know, time just is heading. Hey, we're going to learn this in case this goes bad. Right. Eventually got away with that because they learned that, you know, the system was pretty reliable. You can count on it. Well, we also learned that if that system went bad, there were probably other systems right. that were messed up and you weren't going to go fly anyway. Yep. Yeah. So from Germany, did you go to Hood after Germany? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Yeah. I went to 1227 after okay. that. And that's where, when we got D models, and I was one of the first groups to go out to Boeing uh, to learn how to fly the D model. Mm. And then I had to go back to Boeing to be a uh, D model IP. Okay. So did, was, did they have any kind of UFTP back then? They did. Um, I mean, you're already at Hood, so. <laughs> yeah, but it was funny because we we got the, the D models, and they made us move from Gray Army Airfield over to Hood Army Airfield yeah. to go through UFTP. I mean, lock, stock, and barrel. I'm talking about office, desk, y you name it. And don't want we, you to be comfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we moved, I don't know, they're 10 miles apart. Yeah. We moved everything we had over to uh, Hood Army Airfield to go through UFTP. That makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> so I know you went from Hood. Did you go from Hood to back to 6-6? Six, six? Or was it? Okay. Yeah. What, how did you learn about them putting that unit together? What, or did they give you an option to say, hey, is it time for you to PC? It's time for you to PCS? Or did you volunteer? Or did you hear that they were putting this unit together from uh, Germany? Or? Um, I was D model qualified. So mm -hmm. that, that was a big deal. And so when they were putting 6-6 six, six together, they needed D model pilots. Mm -hmm. And I was an instructor pilot. So when it came time for me to PCS, then I was PCS to 6-6. Six, six which was going to go through UFTP again. Mm. Or, so this would be my second UFTP. Yeah. And um, at Hood. So that's how I ended up in the unit. I went, we sold our house, moved in with with uh, Bettina's parents and stayed in Texas and went through the UFTP. Okay. So those are the, that don't know, so 6-6 six, six is out of Germany. And so they basically... Fold the colors up and brought them back to Texas because you know they're A mo alpha models in uh, Germany. So when they came back, they're going to be D models. So they pretty much took everybody out of that unit and they built a a unit which was six six. But they had all new people except for very few, right. um, a handful of people that stayed with the unit. Right. Um, so when you got there, was there some kind of process that they went through? It was like, hey. These guys are going to go to the Alpha. These guys are going to go to Bravo, or or was that already written into the orders, or how, how did that work out? To who got who? Well, I mean, you had to have so many IPs in in a unit, mm -hmm. you know, in a company or troop, and uh, so they just split up the IPs. I don't I don't know how I ended up in in Bravo troop. Yeah, I did. So, what did you think about the new guys coming in? <laughs> the reason because I'm laughing because I was one of those new guys. Honestly, I mean, I, I I couldn't couldn't care less. No, I didn't say that. I I couldn't like be f show any favoritism or anything like mm -hmm. that to guys. You were a pilot. You were a line pilot, and I would judge you if I judged you on just your ability to do your job. Sure, you know. And we, you know, as well as I do, we had some that did it well. We had some that were mediocre, and we had some that were horrible. What was your biggest challenge back then at that UFTP? And I'm not saying person. I, it could be a person, but I mean, you know, UFTPs are, you know, it's pretty, you're doing something every day. There's not too much. I mean, there's stuff that's in that schedule every day to be accomplishing something. Yeah. So there's not much downtime. So with all that stuff going on, I'm just wondering if there's any point in that that, that just comes forefront in your memory like, man. Not really. That dude needs to go away or, hey, this no, guy's. I, you know, I didn't. I figured we were stuck with the people we had. Mm -hmm. So you either you either made them better or because you, you couldn't make them any worse if they were bad, <laughs> you know. So you, you did the best you could and and you try to take care of people and and try to if they didn't understand something try to break it down to where that they understood it. But again, I was brand new in the aircraft too, so I was still learning and that mm -hmm. if you ask me about challenges, that was a challenge because I'm trying to be a subject matter expert and teach guys uh, that just came out of the course as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. And they look up, you know, they look up to the IP. He's supposed to set the example. He's supposed to know 
be all know all knowing and i'll be the first to admit and I if would, you don't they're like ah <laughs> exactly yeah and i wasn't all knowing i mean there but, is no way well there might be one or two savants out there but there's no, yeah, there's no way as all the systems that i think especially now i mean i'm not sure how familiar you are with the e-model but i don't know how anybody keeps their track of all the knowledge that you have to have to operate that thing now right i mean it's you're a systems operator, not a pilot, right. I think, these days. Well, even back then, but now it's twice as bad. Well, my thing was, uh, I say uh, that you had you had to know your emergency procedures. You had to understand them, why you got a light or this or that. Because when I was in alpha models, I had so many lights come on sometimes they'd be for real sometimes they'd just be a light uh i had the first engine failure in a d model back in 1227 mm. and they looked at me like i was crazy i was like you couldn't have had an engine failure that thing is too good and uh i went back and landed did a roll on landing just just by the book what you're supposed to do taxied in and then you know on that helicopter they could pull all the data right and um they were they looked at the, they looked at that data for days because the engine failure was with Ty Crowder, who was our safety officer. And he was a very experienced aviator. He was a W four, I think, and I was a W three giving him a check ride as an IP. And we were doing an ECU lockout. And uh I told him, you know, I gave him the simulated uh uh under speed or whatever. And he uh, lowered the collective, got the torque down, took the power lever to lock out, retarded it, uh, didn't even hit the idle stop, matched the two engines, and we're flying in the pattern. And then all of a sudden it just, pew, it quit. Mm. And uh, I was like, did you do that? And he's like, no, and I'm looking at the power lever. The power lever's still in the same place. I slammed the power lever forward as it was failing to hoping that it would come back, which probably would have been a bad thing and probably yeah. would have really over the aircraft. But, um, and it, I just, I remember it to this day, he's flying downwind and he's just trucking downwind, single engine. You know, we just had this engine failure and he's just continuing to go downwind. Mm -hmm. I say, hey, Ty, we just had an engine failure, buddy. You need to turn towards the runway. We need to get this thing on the ground. And he was like, yeah, you're, you're right. You know, so we, we did a short downwind and very, very short base and did a roll on landing uneventful mm. um but a big deal because it was the first and uh like i said they pulled all the data they went over it with a fine tooth comb and sure enough there was a ecu on that particular engine that i guess there had been some mods or something and that particular ecu did not get modded and uh and when it and it caused the engine failure mm. but i mean they were they were doubting it. They were like, oh, no, the front seat will pull the power lever off. You know, all the all, all the Monday morning quarterbacks. Well, you know, unfortunately, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm going to throw out a percentage. I don't know if it's correct. I don't really follow it that much anymore. 80, 85 percent of all the problems that they have, it is pilot error. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. you know, everybody assuming, yeah, you know, if you had to throw a dart, <laughs> you're probably sure, right. So, sure. yeah, you can't. I mean, I, I get kind of. Upset about that too. I mean, the first thing you do is, oh, you screwed up. Like, right. You know, you wasn't even there. Right. Well, if you look at the statistics, you know, you're probably right. <laughs> so, well, uh, I was I was saved by the data. You know, yeah, they were able to pull the data. A lot of people think that MDR was something horrible. Right. You know, right. man, you know, Big Brother's looking at everything we do. But well, sometimes it's a good thing, you know, because yeah. they could have blamed you and never would have well, done. I had a I had a emergency with Chuck Day. Um, I, can't, I don't think we were in a D model. I don't remember, but we were out on the range at Fort Hood, and we were we went to the laser point, and we were shooting the laser and engaging targets and that kind of stuff, just mock stuff. Came time to leave, and uh, I turned around, and we were I don't know, we might have been fifty feet off the ground, and I, I pushed the cyclic forward, and as the aircraft as the nose went down. You know, you got to take some of that forward cyclic out because you get the blowback once you get through ETL and uh, couldn't move the cyclic. 
And I screamed at Chuck. I'm like, get off the controls, get off the controls. And he's like, I'm not on the controls. I'm not on the controls. So I got this thing that's it's going forward and it's starting to pitch up and go backwards. So I lower the collective and uh, we, luckily we were in a field. And, and uh, so we start to kind of fall down. And as the aircraft's falling, I still can't move the cyclic. And I actually took my hand off the collective, put both hands on the cyclic, trying to pull it back. And of course, it finally broke loose and I had both hands and I pulled it to the rear stop, which made the, exacerbated the problem. But I got it to the rear stop, lower the collective, pushed it back forward and we hit the ground. And uh, started the APU and could move the cyclic all I wanted to move it. Mm. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I ain't doing, the, I ain't <laughs> flying this thing. <laughs> So, of course, we get on the radio, call range control, tell them we're not off the range. They have some other fixed wing scheduled to come in there and actually drop bombs. And I'm like, we can't, you know, I'm still across the red line. And called the unit, and the unit set, sent up two maintenance guys. And they got in, and we got it to happen one time on the APU, got the collective to start the cyclic to stick. So the commander authorized them a one-time flight back at – 100 feet, no higher than 100 feet or whatever terrain would allow, and no faster than 40 knots. And uh, so they got the airplane back, and the airplane sat in the hangar forever. Mm -hmm. And they were like, and uh, something happened. You know, they were pointing their fingers at me, and they looked this thing over and over and over. And finally, one of the crew chiefs went and took off one of the bottom panels, stuck a mirror up underneath the front seat's uh, cyclic, and that panel the clearance between it and the mixing levers underneath that front seat cyclic is a very, very small space. Mm -hmm. And what had happened, a rivet had got in there and it was rolling around and no telling how long it had been in there. And you get the aircraft in just the right attitude and it'd be just the right place. And it would get underneath those mixing levers under there and stop the cyclic from moving. And we didn't have Bucks aircraft mm -hmm. back then. So you didn't have a choice, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't break out and keep flying no. by wire. And again, crew chief saved, saved me, you know. You know, I forgot all about that. <clears throat> I forgot about their, not all alpha models had bucks. Because mm -hmm. as you're telling that story, I'm like, well, why don't you just go in bucks? And now you said that, I, I forgot about that. It was like a rare thing, I guess, back then for a while that, aircraft had bucks or not right so bucks is a backup control system basically they have these little things on the controls that if you have a bind or something if you pull hard enough the aircraft sees this mismatch of where it thinks it's at and where the controls are so then it automatically goes into a fly-by-wire so you're not mechanically linked to the controls so that's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about yeah. bucks those little things are called spads well you know <laughs> i'm, I'm Okay, audience, this is a spad. You, I'll draw you a diagram if you want. <laughs> Play Mr. IP on me here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so something else significant happened to us while me and you were in the same unit going through your UFTP. Remember what that was? A lot of things. Well, Kinda one was. of the biggest things. Through UFTP? Mm-hmm. Mm. Pretty significant for the whole world. Well, 9-1-1? So 9-11 happened yeah. while me and you were in UFTP together. Yeah. <clears throat> so as we're training... You know, I'll be real honest with you. Training was kind of training, even in the Marine Corps. Yeah, I did some real stuff while I was in the Marine Corps. But even when you get back training, you, you don't. There's not a real. Um, for me, it wasn't a real urgency. Yeah, I guess is, yeah, yeah. that's probably not the right word. But um, okay, you know, you still know it's not true or it's not real, so you have a tendency not to treat it as right. real. So then, nine eleven happens, and then it changes everybody's perception of, of you know it's not if we're going as when right but we knew that we had to go back to germany first so um you know we thought something was going to happen right away i mean i did anyway mm -hmm. um they were going to be sending people over there within the next month well we had another couple months to go right that was a while yeah we had a while to, even before we were done with uftp and then you got the whole move which you know by the time you get everybody back from leave. From leave and everybody's family there, everybody yeah. settled in. It's another month or two yeah. um, on top of that. So did we start leaving? Uh, I know we left probably February. For? Did, we went back, to, that we went to Germany. 
When was that? It was no, after 9-11, it, obviously. It was, it, I think it was like right after Christmas. I remember it being kind of warm. Yeah. No, and why would it be warm there? Uh, I don't know. I don't I don't remember. Yeah, near do I. How long we were. Sorry, we're, we're old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, <clears throat> we 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 knew we were gonna go. And it just so happened that we did get the call to go over there and uh we ended up man, how many units were there? Tons. When we got there to Kuwait. Well, just on the airfield alone. Yeah, so when we started there, it was a it was sand and we, and and all the units were consolidating in Kuwait in different different fobs you know uh, little bases and um I think just about every patch of unit in the army what what was that called Camp Udari yeah Udari it's something else now ain't it I have no I idea I think it's something no. else they called it something else anyway so Camp Udari was a it was a dust bowl basically well by the time mm -hmm. we left there it was a fully paved runway and fully uh, paved man how many aircraft area? you think were there I don't know. I saw an overhead shot of Udari at, at, you know, right before we went. and I got those pictures somewhere. There ain't a parking space available. Yep. Yeah, even inside the clams that they had there, yeah. there was even mm -hmm. aircraft in them things. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to Kuwait, and we were we got the uh, word that we were going to be the first ones crossing into Iraq. Uh, do you remember the brief that we had right before we went over by our leadership? Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> you remember what that person said? Yeah. It, and I can't remember it verbatim, but the the gist of it was all of this is going to be taped and it's going to be on TV. So make sure whatever you do, you do the right thing was basically it. Which, and you also said your tapes will be scrutinized. Yes. Basically, yes. you know, if you sneeze hard, we don't like it. That's We're right. watching you. You're going to have a, mo a Monday morning quarterback whether you want it or not. Yeah. Yep. Which really hurt us as a unit. Yeah. And so what do you think? <laughs> now, I'm I'm sure I'm being biased here, and I'm sure every, every other unit's going to say the same thing, but what do you think made our troops so good and so tight? Because I know the other troops that was in our battalion, and I know for sure they wasn't as tight as our group was. Yeah. What, made you, what makes you think it got like that? You had a great SP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, could now, be. Uh, I don't know. We all just gelled. We had the right mix. We had the right mix of young. We had the right mix of medium, and we had the right mix of old. Mm -hmm. And and even with our enlisted guys, yeah. and um, I think the pilots cared for the enlisted guys. Enlisted guys cared for the pilots. There wasn't that normal, you know, back and forth. Uh, we're working our butts off. You're not. Especially mm -hmm. when they would see aircraft come back shot up, they knew that we were out doing what what they you know what they thought we were doing mm. and um it got real for them as well yeah. and it got real for them on the way up sure. to ramps you know. you know something else happened what before we even left you remember that big explosion that happened oh god yeah you talking about the channel hall or the well or that the, too i forgot about that you know i got video of that somewhere yeah i, I, too. I got video and pictures of all that stuff <laughs> yeah so we were living in udari and we were fat and happy we were. i mean the chow hall there was better than most restaurants in the States. We're like, how in the world are we out in the middle of the desert? And this food is so good. I'm like, we we must be getting ready to die because we're feeding <laughs> us very well. Yep. And we took that for granted for, sure <laughs> for what, two or three weeks, I guess it was. Yep. And I remember being, sitting on, sitting on my cat inside our little hooch thing. And somebody said, the child's, a hole, the child's on fire. I'm like, really? I'm like, That's kind of funny, you know? I'm like, let's go check it out. And so I go over there and this thing is just, and then all of a sudden, everybody starts realizing, like, well, I wonder when they're going to build another one. <laughs> well, they they never did. That's right. Until you remember we what we ate? We were eating MREs, cold weather MREs. Well, we were eating cold weather MREs. We were eating rice and boiled eggs. Yep. yep. I remember that. Well, the other significant thing I was alluding to was the uh, that tornado that got shut down. Yes. Yeah. We were in the same tent, weren't we? Yeah. And I think I've told this story already on this podcast, but um, you remember Todd O'Dee's event that happened? Mm -mm. So we didn't know. We didn't know at the time it was a friendly fire. Um, we right. thought it was a scud hitting. Right. So of course, all the uh, chemical, you know, all the alarms are going off. You know, gas, gas, gas. So everybody starts getting all their stuff and right. putting it on. I was 90% sure it wasn't, you know, 
I was like, okay, whatever. So I'm kind of slow putting my stuff on. I'm like, listen, I don't want to be, you know, the shit bag that's not doing what they're told, but I'm in no hurry. So I'm putting my stuff on. Well, OD is, he's freaking out a little bit. <laughs> so he's pulling all his stuff out of, out of his bags and he's finally getting his stuff on. And he finally gets his, you know, his mask and he puts it on and, uh, he looks at me. I mean, we were right next to each other. He looks at me. He's like, what the fuck is this? And I could hear him clear as day. You know, it didn't, you know, he had a mask on, but I could hear him like he was, didn't have a mask on. And I'm like, I'm like looking at him. I'm like, what? And because everybody's going crazy. And uh, he's like, what the fuck is this? And he's pointing at his, at his face. Well, his eye <laughs> thing was out. <laughs> and uh, he's like really freaking out. Mm. And so, of course, you know, me being who I was, I started laughing at him. I was like, man, you're going to fucking die, dude. You're going <laughs> to fucking die. And so we were cussing at each other back and forth. And uh, I just thought that was funny. Yeah. At the cost of a guy getting shut down. But yeah. That wasn't good. No. Shook the whole tent. Yeah. Well, that's why everybody thought it was a chemical yeah. thing. They thought Scud had hit right next to us. Yeah. And we were all going to die from chemicals. But uh, wasn't the case. Nope. All right. So uh, let's take a break real quick. And we're going to talk about a significant event that we had. We'll be back. Okay. Sound good? All right. Thank you. Dude, dude, what are you doing? Definitely not playing with expensive wooden helicopters. I was uh, trying to tell the audience to uh, like and subscribe. Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, that's... Uh... All right, man, we're back. So we're going to talk about the same shit that we just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we've had... You know, I, I just said it, but uh, a lot of the conversations that we've had off camera and during our breaks and then before we've gone, you know, we've been catching up quite a, quite a bit. And um, after we're done talking, I'm like, man, we should have been sitting down talking about this in front of camera. So we're going to go over everything that we just kind of talked about. So um, I think where we left off is we're getting ready to push off from Kuwait into Iraq. Um, the first mission we go to kind of got called back. For whatever reason. Um, but part of that mission was our crew chiefs and all of our support was already pushing forward. And they were going to go meet us approximately about halfway between Kuwait and Baghdad, out in the middle of the desert somewhere, um, just a point on a map. And uh, so they left the, the day before us um, so that they would be up there by the time that we took off the next day. Yep. And they were going to meet us with fuel and all kinds of good stuff. So our crew chiefs were in the heat of it <laughs> a couple of days before we even took off. I guess it was yeah. about a day or two. Yeah. And um, so we had this mission plan um, that would go a certain way. And um, we get up, by the time we get up to Rams, we realized it wasn't quite like we what we planned, right? right? And we talked a little bit about the documentary that has been done. It's called Apache Warrior. Um, it's a little bit more in depth than what we're going to talk about, but you know, just the hint on that a little bit. How much accuracy do you think that documentary was? The overall story, I think, was very was pretty accurate, mm -hmm. but the players weren't as accurate as it could have been. I yeah. think, but yeah. there were various reasons for that. Yeah, and it's also hard to <laughs> put the fear and all the other aspects and a little bit of the anger and all the other different emotions that's going into that. It's kind of hard to document that. Definitely. Right? I mean, you can hear some of it in the tapes, but you, in, you know, unless you're sitting in that cockpit and with those people, you really don't get to grasp the whole story. And believe me, this would be a very long podcast if we went in detail about everything to get the real grasp of it. And uh, we're not, we're just not going to do that. Just know that it sucked ass. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And, um, the only good thing about that that came is we were able to get the army away from fighting Russians for the past 20, 30 years, I think. Yeah, exactly. And I think that was a, a great thing to get away, to open people's eyes up, I think. You know, once you have, this is going to be bad to say, but once you've had so many years of peace, people get stuck in their ways for so long 
And a lot of people that are making decisions don't have the, either they don't have the ability or they don't have the, the pull to be able to change things. You know, things are the way they are. They've worked this long. Why are you changing stuff? Right. Um, but it, it really opened up everybody's eyes as a, as a whole, just not one or two people, the whole right. community, the whole Army Aviation, I think, changed that day. But uh, what are some of the significant things that you're, I mean, I know it's a pretty broad question, but what are some of the significant things you remember from that night? Uh, pre-mission. Pre-mission. So, so we're talking about, you know, we can talk about leaving Kuwait, but that was kind of uneventful, uneventful. Mm-hmm. But from the time that we actually landed at Rams and realized that we were way behind the power curve, what were some of the significant things you remember before we took off? Well, before I even got there, I had a generator failure in my aircraft. So I was in 203 tail number. And uh, there was another aircraft that wasn't modded yet, and it had 701 engines. The 203 had 701Cs, which was a little more powerful. And uh, so I ended up, we had another task force within the task force that was going to be used for pilot recovery called Task Force Gabriel. And uh, one of the guys that was in that, he was flying 199. And like I said, it had 701s in it. And since they were pilot recovery and our mission was priority, I ended up switching aircraft, getting in his aircraft. And since it wasn't modified, uh, the engines weren't. When I took off in that thing, I was having to milk every little bit of it to get it up in the air and get it airborne, mm. you know, with a full load of gas. And and that was another problem. There was no gas up there. There were some, but there wasn't enough for everybody. So the command had to decide who was a priority for getting fuel. And, uh, well, the was priority was well, so the way I remember it, there wasn't a priority until after we were just about our, <laughs> our troop specifically was already full. Right. And they were just getting about halfway down with the rest of the troops that were in our battalion, right? Our squadron. And, um, that's when the decision was made hey, we got, <laughs> we got to ration this stuff. Right. So, how many aircraft were supposed to take off that night? What, three battalion or three squadrons, right? So six, six, two, six, and two, two, sevens, right? Yeah. So all three squadrons were supposed to take off. And, man, not even half. I don't think so. Not even half got fuel to even be able to take off on that mission. Mm. So, you know, one thing, we didn't have gas. We were supposed to have a current intelligence brief before we took off. We didn't have comms to our higher echelon headquarters to give us a brief on what was going on. Right. The mission was to go up and to kill some artillery pieces that were supposed to have chemical weapons that they were going to shoot into our guys that were coming up north into Baghdad. Um, there was also supposed, also supposed to be a artillery mission that was fired. It's called a SEED. It's called a Suppression of Enemy Air, air Defense. And that was a timed event. And anybody that's been in the military knows that a SEED is a very well-coordinated thing. And once a time is set, it's pretty much a go. There's no change in it because there's so many moving parts. And so what's supposed to happen is right before you, you know, you take off, the artillery shoots along your route or the enemy, wherever they're at, or around about where they're at, to try to keep their heads down as you're flying through, you know, their line of defense or, 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 or flood or wherever, four line of troops. Um, so that, that, that specific seed, I think it was at 1030. Or 9.30. I, I'm, Whatever. I'm going to make this time up because I can't remember. We're going to say it was supposed to be shot at 10.30. Well, we were still on the ground at 10.30 getting fuel. So we heard out in the distance, well, there's our seed mission getting shot. <laughs> so by the time that we, they made a decision to actually take off, all of that planning that went to help us get along our route, if, if anything, it hurt us because that gives them a heads up. Hey, you know, something's going to be happening here. They just shot artillery at us. So, um there were a lot of discussions between higher ups <laughs> before I was taking off, and I'll go ahead and name them: um, or Colonel Wolf and Colonel Barbie, and some of the other uh, squadron commanders. We all had the discussions. A lot of the S three people were involved, which I don't remember their names. And to be honest with you, it's not even worth mentioning their name. Um, we're making a decision of whether we're going to be flying or not. I know the some of the, I know the company commanders were up there in the discussion. But, you know, if they did have any kind of voice, it wouldn't have been heard. Um, there was some discussion that 
you know, we got to get in this fight. We're going to get in this fight. We're going to do everything we can get in this fight. Um, not to, you know, they might have taken an account and stuff, everything was going wrong, but it seemed like it was more important for us to get up there and show that Apaches are in a war than it was to be smart about it. And yeah. it almost cost two battalions worth of aircraft and pilots. Yeah. Um, so we took off and our troop was the first ones out. Um, headed up the route on uh, two set well, two to seventh kind of left at the same time, but they were going on a different direction. Um, so as we're flying up the route, um, we were teams of two. And how close was that to Baghdad? It was like 20 miles south of Baghdad, or wasn't even that much. I know it was real close to Baghdad. I couldn't tell you now, but yeah. I know it was supposed to be to their air defense school as well. Mm. And, um, yeah, we we're supposed to recon that yeah. that airfield prior to us going over on right. the MSR. And uh it was it was dark. And then you could see lights everywhere. You could see the city lights and stuff, but our routes were pretty much or at least they tried to make the routes kind of outside those man made things and tried to keep us in the open desert, but that didn't work for us either at a certain point. Yeah, another thing is they, they'll teach you, even prior to this, you know, you never egress out the same route that you're ingressing in. Yep. <clears throat> and that had been a contention between all of us before, you know, this that mission was planned when we were still in Germany. Um, so it was, <laughs> quote, battlefield tested for quite a long time before we actually flew this thing. <clears throat> and it was brought up many times about the ingress and egress routes, but they figured it would be out in the open so much in the open desert that it wasn't going to be that much of a factor. Right. And so we went up, uh, me and the guy I was flying with and, um, Mike Tomlin, he's in the documentary too. And his wingman, Jason, or his uh, co-pilot, uh, Jason King, we were up there looking at the airfield and you can watch my tape and I'm, I'm looking for anything that, you know, anything, and it got to a point where I was so locked on to something. I was like, I know that's something. And Bob's like, hey, zoom out, zoom in, zoom in. And I'm like, what is it? What is it? He's like, uh, man, that's a tower. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. Also, I was at antennas, you know, I was like, that's bad guys. Right. So it ended up being nothing there. And if there was something there, they were very well hidden. Right. So we kind of just bypassed that and went tor towards the target. And you were, so there were three teams of two. Red, blue, uh, and white. I was the one fur further north. There was another team that was ten, about ten k's behind us, and that then was me. And then there was another group of two behind that. All right. And so, as we started heading west, yep. Um, I don't remember hearing too much radio chatter as far as you know, um, seeing enemy fire or anything like that. All right. Well, here's here's the first problem we were doing. A deep, a deep attack. movement to contact, oh, right. <laughs> if you will. Yeah, and you don't do deep movements to contact. You know. Yeah. So people Doing, don't people don't know it's a, it's a deep attack right. or it's our movement to contact. Right. We did both at the same time. Right. Which is even written that you don't do those two. Right. But we did it anyway. Yeah. So we had gone in, and I was lead. Me and the guy I was flying was was lead, and um. We found some wires that were very, very high that wasn't on the map or depicted anywhere. And so we started climbing, called Mike, said, hey, man, there's a large set of wires here. Well, as we climbed the wires, he caught the wires too. Well, he, somehow he got in front of us. Well, when he got in front, of us, in front of us, he started coming down. And then all of a sudden, the radio chatter from him. Hey, we're taking fire, taking fire. I didn't see anything. My head's buried in the Taz. I really wasn't even looking outside the cockpit. And um, so I'm trying to see, I'm looking at him and I'm looking down where he's at and I don't see nothing. I don't see no movement. I don't see anything. And then um, I remember this big flash of light and it was this huge explosion. And I immediately thought that that was him that crashed. You know, now knowing what happened is he saw somebody shooting at him and he was behind a propane tank. Mike turned around, looked at him, 
and shot him, hit the hit the fuel tank and exploded, and that's what the explosion was. Mm-hmm. At that same time, around that same time, Jason gets shot in the neck. And that's when all the radio chatter. It seemed like everything happened at once. And well, there was something that happened before that that we didn't, at least I didn't take into account. Right. Um, you know, somebody, I forget who, I think it might have been you on the radio. Mm-hmm said, hey, those lights in the city just went out, <laughs> and they all just came back on. Yep. And and I'm listening to it, and I'm like, so fucking what? You know what I mean? What's the significance of that? Yeah. Um, being a newer aviator, you know, all my stuff has been done on the ground, and I never heard of anything like that. But come to find out, that was like an indication to the whole city. Hey, we're going to turn these lights out when they come back on, just start shooting up in the air. Yep. So whatever you hear, doesn't matter, just everybody. <laughs> yep. And that's kind of what happened. It was eerie. It was, you know, we turned to the west and started going inbound because we had some pre-planned waypoints or targets that we we were going to run racetracks on. And and uh, when we turned west, I mean, it looked like somebody had a master control to that city, and every light, as far as you could see, went out. Yep. And they were out for about five seconds, five ten seconds. And then all of them came on. And when they came back on, the sky was filled with red, white, orange, green balls, which were all ordnance coming up in the sky. Some were some were streaks, some were balls, some yeah. were <laughs> you couldn't identify anything. And even what's weird about that is you would think with all that stuff coming up, you'd be able to see where it was coming from. Right. But it was so much you couldn't you couldn't trace back okay just say for instance you saw a tracer going around the sky well you can kind of see the trajectory so you can kind of figure out kind of where it came from but there was so much it was such an overload that you couldn't pick out one individual thing right and i was all over the place on the ground looking through the flare and you know i didn't see anybody the whole time well when that was happening i didn't see anything but that that's when that's when the chaos started and that's when you had some significant events why don't you tell us how uh you saw it from where you were at uh when we turned in my wingman was uh bjorn and who was wing who was bjorn's front seater oh uh chow chow yeah Yeah. and um so bjorn and chow we had staggered our racetrack so that so that we went in first and as we were outbound uh, Bjorn and Chow were going in, and the radios were just cooking. I mean, everybody was, especially the guys down south, they were screaming, they were taking fire. We were taking fire. You guys are taking fire. And as I was coming out, we tried three times to get in there and try to engage those targets. And, of course, we're trying to send messages back to the follow-on troops that, you know, it's it's a hornet's nest up here be ready and uh, we went in and like i said when i was going out i had ak-47 around come through the cockpit and almost hit me in the head and uh at the time it's weird you're i don't want to say you're not scared but your adrenaline is so pumping through your body that you're trying to figure out a way to get this guy that's trying to get me kind Mm -hmm. of thing and uh that AK forty uh, that AK forty seven round come through the cockpit and the plexiglass busted and hit me in the face and I thought I'd been shot. Hell, I didn't know the difference. I'd never been shot before, so this must this must be what it is to be shot. Hmm. Put my hands on my face to see if there was any blood or anything, and of course the cockpit's black. And took my hands down and looked at the looked at my gloves and there was no blood on my hands. And then I realized that I had quit flying the aircraft. Well, luckily, my front seater, Captain Mace, had already took the controls when I told him I was hit. And uh, I realized I was okay. And I said, give me back the controls, you know. Mm-hmm. And so now you got aircraft that the radios are being shot out because they're getting shot. And they can only talk on one. And they're having to switch frequencies and all kinds of stuff. And our radios weren't working well. And we're trying to talk back to uh, the S3 and let them know what's happening and uh, we can't talk. So then I'm trying to talk to my wingman whose radio is still working, that that particular FM, can you talk back? And now we're having to relay messages. 
that was a mess. All the time we're trying to fight. We're trying to keep from getting shot at. We're, we're not get or keep from getting shot. And uh, then the next big event is King gets shot. And then things really went to hell in a handbasket because. The, well, before we get there, let me pause. Yeah. So when you say, you know, you get AK-47 round went from my cockpit. What I'm going to try to describe a little bit better is the day after we looked at your cockpit. And if you're sitting in the back seat, there was a round. You can see an entry on this side, and you can see an exit on the other side. And we had you get up and sit in the cockpit how you normally fly. And I took a picture of it, and I have it somewhere. Hopefully, I can find it. Um, but my stuff's pretty buried, so it might be a chance. You might not be able to see it. So that's why I'm going to describe it now. But that round should have went right through your head, yeah. like right in the middle of your head and right back out. That's where it should have been, according to where that trajectory was. Like you said earlier, if you would have put a dial pin through that one end and out the other, it would have went about right here and about out right there. Yeah. So that's but, that's a little bit more significant than the way you're describing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How that is the magic bullet. It was a JFK bullet. Well, I think just I've thought about it many a night. I think I was bent over or reaching to push a button, which had caused my whole body to move forward. Mm -hmm. And that's why the round didn't hit me. Mm -hmm. That's all I can come up yep. with. Sorry to interrupt you. So we're back to King. King yeah, so, so King gets shot. And <clears throat> the, the weird part of that story, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but, you know, we all wore our, our Alsa gear. And you had bandages in your Alsa gear, but one of your bandages was up here. And he had actually taken that bandage out from up here and put it in his leg zipper pocket, mm -hmm. which, so when he gets shot through the throat, he's able to reach down and get that bandage and put it on his throat to stop the bleeding. And, um, and he's trying to talk on the radio and he's garbled and, you know, he sounds like he's drowning his own blood. And that set the tone, I think, for the whole flight. Mm -hmm. When everybody heard that, it was like, oh, my God, we're all fixing to die. Continuing on back out to... Oh! Keep your right oh. the Archer 6. Fuck. I'm hit. I'm hit like... Like a pit. Oh, 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 I just went up with all on far and narrow. Hey, 1-9, this is 1-6. Oh, my front shooter oh, has been oh, hit. He's taken around. Zero six, zero six, break, break, zero six. One nine has been hit. His front seater has been hit. We are egress at this time. Egress at this time. Head to the west of the route. Last call. Roger, understand. West of the route. White team. Are you going to be okay, sir? Mike, are you still with us? West side of the route. Egress back to the south. And we had a contingency plan of what he was supposed to, what that team, if, if a team had a wounded crew member, what they were supposed to do. And I'll let you talk about that. But my front seater, Captain Mace, who was a commander of the troop, he, you know, he was worried about King. He was trying to get uh, you guys to talk to him, to update him. When I say you guys, I mean your team and, of course, Tomlin's radios, who was King's backseater, his radios weren't working that well. You guys' weren't working that well. It was hard for us to talk back and forth. And then since our radios weren't working, we were trying to relay to Bjorn, my wingman, to get all this information back to hire while we're still in the middle of this attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just a mess. And at some point... um. I told the commander, I was like, we got to get out of here. We, we've tried this three times, you know, and I'm not a baseball player, but three strikes and you're out. And um, I said, we can't go back in there. We got to get out of here. And so then we had to develop a plan to get us out of there, knowing that the other two troops were coming up the same route that we had just come up. And how are we going to deconflict? How are we going to be able not to run nose to nose with them when we couldn't talk to them? Mm. You know, so it was, so we're relaying this back to the S3. The S3 is trying to talk 
to those troops who have already took off and trying to tell them that we're coming back and which side of the route they needed to be on, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it was a mess. <clears throat> so the two significant things about that portion of it, after he had gotten shot, so the contingency, contingency plan was there was a Black Hawk that was going to be loitering further away from where we were at. <laughs> and it was supposed to be this very safe area out in the middle of nowhere. And um, so we were calling back to them. And like you said, our S3 was in, in that Black Hawk trying to coordinate. Black Hawk was going to land. We were going to put King in the Black Hawk. The S3 guy was going to jump in mics and then, and then fly back. Um, so on the way there, you know, we were lead, Mike and Jason were behind us. And I knew he, Mike had his, you know, hands full. So I was trying to, my best to coordinate everything. Hey, this is where we're at. This is where we're going to come. We're coming in, blah, blah, blah. We're going to be there. I give him time when we're going to be there and everything. And um, along the way back there, we just started, you know, we thought, because we just flown through the same route that we're going back. And it was clear, you know. Wasn't nothing. Very little buildings yep. that I remember. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, once we get out of this area, and I remember when it when it when it first started going off. I remember telling Bob, I was like, Bob, get the fuck away from him. I'm like, I'm like, we need to get back. Get the fuck away from him. And I feel horrible for saying it because I feel like I'm like, what do you mean, you little sissy? <laughs> get away from him. But the the reason I wanted to get away from him is because I didn't know where they were. I couldn't identify anybody. We're just getting our asses handed to them. I'm like, listen, we need to get back, get some distance so we can focus on where these guys are. I want to put some lead on them, but I can't do that if I can't see or find anybody. Well, by that time, he got shot and we're on our way back. So doing a coordination with the Blackhawk, trying to get him back um, to get him some help. And um, probably about halfway there, we get lit up on the route that we're coming back. And I, honestly, I don't remember where you guys were. I don't know. I'm pretty sure you were in front of us, but I had no clue, no clue where everybody was. And so I'm watching out for, you know, I'm as we're flying down the route, I knew everybody was over this way. So I'm kind of, as I'm flying, I'm looking for, you know, enemy on the, on, on the system. And I'm also looking out the window, you know, if I can see anything, you know, see where anything's coming from. So my orientation wasn't anything over here, you know, to my left. Cause that was, that was the clear area <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> Well, all of a sudden, we start getting lit up. I mean, you hear stuff just hitting the aircraft, tick, 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 you know, and you hear stuff cracking and popping and, uh, you know, pretty significant event. Well, as this is going on, I'm trying to get a hold of Mike and say, hey, man, how, you know, I can't see you back there. How's that? You know, are you still with us? He never answered. So, I, Mike, you know, so, so for a good 30 seconds, you know, I'm trying to get him back and I, and me and me and Bob both felt it, man. We got to turn around and go right back through where we just came from. And we didn't say it, but I was just getting to race A, man, we got to turn around. And right at that time, Hey, yeah, I'm with you, man. Everything's good. Uh, just like <laughs> nothing was happening. I'm like, did you just fly through the same shit that we did? Uh, we I, we I, all I, heard that. Yeah. We thought the rest of the troop, at least in my aircraft, me and Captain Mace, we were like, Oh no, those guys, they've crashed. And, you know, because Mike wasn't answering you, mm. and because we were all on the troop internal, yeah. and uh, it was like, what the heck? And then finally, he come up on the on the net. Yeah. So as all that was happening, I hear, "Oh shit!" And I feel the aircraft just. I mean, it must have been you know, 45, 60 degree turn to the right. And I'm and I'm just waiting for an explosion because I I think he sees something that I don't that we're getting ready to get you know get hit. And he's like, man, did you see that? And I'm like, no. And I just totally dismissed anything that just happened and and just concentrated back to what I was doing. I need to find somebody to shoot at, you know. And uh, come to find out later, as we reviewed our tapes and after you know talking to him after everything got settled down and days later, we looked at our tapes and that was that Blackhawk that we were supposed to go <laughs> team up with mm -hmm. well we almost hit him mm -hmm. and if you look at the the tape like if you know you're looking at the front of the air our aircraft this black hawk was in a pretty steep dive to what would be their right and when he said oh shit bob went like this and so it looked like in the video that the rotors went in between each other now i know it didn't because if it did it would have hit 
but it looked like that in the video. It, it was that close. We almost we almost ran in that Blackhawk mm -hmm. coming back. There's light horse one six one nine on uniform. Roger. Roger. One six is one nine on your four. Take over. Shit. One six. Oh goddamn. This is one nine one six. Hey, look one. This route about ten k. I'm correcting to the east. Come to the east of the route. Where you at? I'll turn towards the left, dude. One second. Oh, is he with us? Yes. And once we realized that, and we were still taking significant, even though Blackhawk was taking rounds, um, it was decided, hey, we ain't risking <laughs> landing here, which we thought it was a safe area. Uh, we're just, we're going to drive on. We asked Mike, he's like, hey, you good for us just to go on back? And he's like, absolutely, let's get out of here. So, um, but once again, um, picking up that route to get back home, which we all thought it was clear because we just came up it and there wasn't nothing there. That was more significant than the initial mm -hmm. rounds. At least it was for us. I mean, it seemed like every 30 seconds, you know, it was a laser light show coming coming at you okay. all the way until about two or three minutes before we landed. Yep. And I was like, when are we getting home? <laughs> because to that point, I still could not find anything. I couldn't see anything. I mean, that system was so degraded for, you know, whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, I couldn't shoot anything because, you know, the hydraulics were shot out. And so the hydraulics, you know, runs a lot of the systems. So you couldn't even select a weapon to shoot. And every time you did, it'd give you an error. Mm -hmm. So that made it even worse knowing that you just got to take whatever they get you. <laughs> you can't do nothing. You did know? you Did you guys count how many rounds had hit your aircraft? <sighs> so, you know, I'm sure they did. I'm sure somebody did. But, you know... I would be taking a wild guess at it, 40, 50. I, you know, yeah. I know all, you know, our SP bundle, which is our system processor bundle, got completely shot out. Mm -hmm. I know the, several through the rotor system, all the blades, our tail rotor drive shaft, our intermediate drive shaft, all had holes in it, um, <clears throat> had holes in the cockpit, had one right behind. Um, one went right behind Bob's head, right? One right behind Bob's head, one right in between where the two doors meet. Mm -hmm. um, one of our pilots actually had an M16 sitting right here, yep. right at the cockpit, and it hit his barrel. And it was chow. Uh, if it didn't hit that barrel, it would have hit him. Yep. Um, yeah, just. I counted mine. And I, my, I, mine was 13. Yeah. I had a round in every blade, but I had, I think they were 12, 12.7 12 millimeter. They were big holes mm -hmm. in every blade. And if aircraft flew like it, had holes in every blade. Yeah, that's, you know, one of the things I want, wanted to get to after, but we'll go ahead and mention it now. Um, the confidence I had in that aircraft afterwards, I felt invincible. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I don't care what you get. If I ever get out of this life, when I get back up, it's, it's game on. Oh, yeah. So um, I think that's what everybody's attitude was. The survivability was incredible. Yep. Yeah, we shouldn't have got back. Yeah. I don't know how. Um, I, I don't know what was it like forty minute flight back to the. It was TAA. like forty five minute. It, it was forever, and I think, don't hold me to this, but I think I was the last one to land. I think you were because you landed the farthest away from everybody. I did, and which was smart of you because it was a clusterfuck going yeah. in that place. You guys were like a, a stirred up wasp nest yep. in there, all trying to land, and I was listening to the radio and. I, and I told Mace, I said, hey, we're just going to hang out here until everybody gets on the ground. And he wanted to do that for just to make sure reasons, everybody got in. To yeah. make sure everybody got back. Yeah. And then it got my turn to land. <laughs> and I had to do that fantastic dust landing out yeah. there, you know. Yeah. To, uh, how would you so, – so people that's never done that, can you describe what a dust landing is and, and what's the challenges of that? Yeah, sure. Um, 
the challenge is to keep the aircraft moving forward fast enough to keep the dust cloud behind you because once once the aircraft stops or slows too much the dust is going to envelop you okay so why does the system help you exactly so <laughs> well, that's what i'm asking you can look through the system and if you look straight down yeah. you can always see something you may not be able to see a big picture but you can see a rock you can see a piece of grass you can see a hole in the ground whatever the case may be. And if you focus on that, you can get the aircraft to the ground. Yeah. But it has to be a continuous forward movement to the ground. So doing a dust landing in itself is a very significant event. Very significant. Okay, so doing that while your aircraft's barely flying and chaos going on, you know, how many radios were on aircraft at that time? Like five, four? Right. We had a bunch. There was a whole bunch, and you were monitoring every one of them. So every time somebody had to talk, no matter what frequency it is, it's coming over your headset. So you got five, four or five different radios going on at the same time. You're trying to have a conversation between you and the guy that's flying with you, um, trying to do a dust landing. Yep. <laughs> so that was probably the, and that was probably one of the most dangerous portions of the whole mission was getting back in the getting airfield. everybody back into yeah. the TAA. And I will tell you, and this is just my opinion, I don't care how many you've done. They don't get any oh, easier. No. Yeah, you know? I agree. I yeah. mean, you learn a good technique and you develop sure. your technique, but I don't think they get any easier. Yeah, there's always that ass clenching. Yep. No matter how many times you've done it. Sure. And if you say it's not, then you're a liar. Yeah, definitely. So, we all get back. I Now, I, let me jump back a little bit. I remember when we were taking off, I heard on the radio that somebody had crashed on, on takeoff. Yeah. And so we had that in our minds. I'm yep. like, man, who was that? Well, okay, we know what any of us. Was. So once we found out, not to be, you know, not considerate of other people, but once you figure out, okay, it's none of us, we're all good, let's go. Mm -hmm. It was kind of out of my mind mm -hmm. until we got back. And then when we got back, I saw that aircraft. I'm like, how in the world did they survive that? Yep. Which goes again, you know, the survivability of that thing. Mm -hmm. So what are... Remember one of the first things that we did when we all got back? I know we all got back. We all gathered around the the termite mound mm. there. And everybody, the purpose of that really was to. Accountability. Accountability. We're calling out everybody's name to make sure they got back. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, there was one crew that didn't get back. That was with the uh, 227th, right? Yep. yep. Ron Young and Dave, what was Dave's last name? I don't remember. He was in 227 with you, I think, wasn't he? No, he wasn't in 227 when I was in 227. Okay. But, yeah. Well, you know, Dave was, I believe he was a SEER instructor mm -hmm. at some point. And Ron Young, I went to flight school with him. Um, but there was a lot of events that happened with them that we found out later, yeah. which was kind of surprising a little bit. But um, every aircraft that took off that night, there wasn't one aircraft that came back that was flyable. Yeah. All aircraft had to, they right. couldn't take off again until they had significant maintenance done to them. I ended up flying 203 like the next, it was like two days later. Mm -hmm. But the only reason it was flyable was because I had that generator failure. And they, when the crew chiefs had gotten there, they were able to change out that generator. And in the midst of all that, we had like this big mud storm. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I remember that. And the aircraft were just coated and mm. caked in mud. Um, and we were like, you really want us to go fly? And how are we going to get this mud off these aircraft so we can even see out of the windshield? And and uh, then we learned later on that uh, that the Iraqis had, had their uh, Republican Guard had formed and they were moving south <clears throat> and they were fixing to get us. I've come to find out that that was a myth. Really? Yeah. I actually talked to some people there on the ground that that never happened. Really? Yeah. That that was all what they thought it was and, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> which, you know, <clears throat> but, you know, when you're going through it, it's real. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So if you can imagine yourself out in the middle of nowhere, nobody else around with a bunch of shut up aircraft that can't take off. And we all had nine mil pistols, <laughs> yeah. sitting and, in and a trench, sitting with a in a trench pistol. in a green tent, and then they come across the radio and said, "There's a 
battalion or regiment or whatever it was, what it was of tanks that are coming and everybody get ready to fight. <laughs> and yeah. We were just like laughing. We got my mind nine mil. I'm like, okay, well, we'll see how this goes. But yeah, nah, I think that was a, well, I was told that that was, <clears throat> that wasn't the case. Hmm. So another thing, um, I mean, you can't go without saying our crew chiefs, right. Who, um, put those aircraft back together. I mean, those guys are heroes in my book. I mean, it got to the point where we couldn't, you know, the dust landings became so dangerous. You know, they were always trying to think of something to do. So they, I think somebody had stole the, uh, a truck, you know, those big, um, those real big ass dump trucks, you know, the mm -hmm. ones they use in real big quarries. Mm -hmm. Somebody went and hot wired one of those. Some you know, army, somebody from the army went and hot wired them and they had a quarry kind of next to us where we were at. And so they got a bunch of rock and they started pouring pads, you know, putting rock down. So for the, the pads were there. I think engineers actually did that. Yeah. And, um, and that wasn't, I mean, that was good. It helped, but it wasn't really doing anything. So they had a great idea. I'm like, well, you know what? Keep the dust down. You know, if we put water on it, it's just going to evaporate. Let's pour some JP8 on it. <laughs> so yeah. these pads were just covered with basically diesel fuel. Yep. And uh, so you had these crew. I mean, the smell was, I mean, you can imagine s sitting and standing in a, what's that, 20 by 20 square, mm -hmm. I guess, um, of, of a diesel-soaked pit and sitting there for six, eight, ten hours a day fixing these aircraft, inhaling that stuff. And you got aircraft taking off right beside you who's kicking up all that dust, that diesel-soaked dust, spitting it up there, and you're breathing it. So, you know, those guys went through some stuff, and hopefully uh, there wasn't no long-term effects of them being that. Well, for us, too. I mean, mm -hmm. we had to fly through that stuff. But uh, they were— Well, they worked day and night. Yeah, they were exposed more first. than we were to it. Definitely. Now, if you remember that time, <laughs> we were told, yeah, you, you know, it's probably going to be about three months. Um, you know, once once we get through Baghdad, we're going to start our rotations coming through. You know, you guys are going to be going back, and then, you know, we're going to – you probably have to come back in six, eight months or whatever, but we're going to figure out a rotation. So when we were there at Rams, we were waiting to get the word when we're going back to Kuwait to put our aircraft back on a boat and go back to Germany. So how long was we there? We was there for a month, month and a half. Well, I wasn't there the whole time because <clears throat> huh? my dad got – my dad uh, got that's sick. right. I he forgot about cancer. that. And uh, the Red Cross had called and said uh, he was about to die. Mm -hmm. And uh, the commander said, you can either go back now while he's still alive or you can go back when he dies. And I elected to go back while he was still alive. And so I caught a Black Hawk out of Rams back down to Kuwait and got on some military transport that was it was a civilian aircraft but it was contracted by the mm -hmm. military went back to germany to see him and by the time i got back you guys had moved to blood you hadn't been there very long because when i got back i was on the first c-130 that landed at blood gotcha remember how long that was well i was only allowed 10 days of leave yeah, for some reason, a month stuck in my mind that we were there at Rams for a month waiting. And then, and then while we were there, you know, they started calling units. Hey, I think 2-6 was the first one. Hey, guys, go back and go back to Kuwait. You guys are going back. And then uh, a couple of weeks go by or whatever it was, hey, 2 2 seven, go back. You're gonna get we're like, all right, man, we're next. <laughs> we're waiting our turn. And so about, you know, the same time frame later, we get this call. Hey, guys, uh... It's really backed up back there at the port, so um, we're going to get you on some hard stands, and you know they're mm -hmm. going to go to uh, a Blot airfield. I'm like Blot? What the hell's Blot Air? I never even heard of Blot. that. Wasn't on none of my mission briefs, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So I'm like, wait a minute, that's north. That's north of Baghdad. Aren't we supposed to be going south? And um, so we ended up being up a Blot for what another four months or so. And while we were up a Blot. We had a change of command, and I don't know if you remember this part, but the uh, our outgoing colonel, Colonel Wolf, he briefs us all. Hey guys, 
you guys are going to get the word any day. I'll meet you back in Germany. You know, thank you guys for all the work you've done. You know, blah, 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 blah. So we're like, all right, get out. You know, <laughs> see you later. Right, right. <laughs> and then the very next day, after they do the change of command, Colonel Wolf leaves. And this new guy comes in, Bill, Billiford, I think. Mm -hmm. Billiford comes in. Hey, guys. Hey, I, I'm real excited to take over. You know, Hey, we got to buckle down there six months, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're going to, we're going to win this thing. Blah. And everybody didn't even hear a word he said after he said another six months. We're like, what did he, and everybody's looking at each other. Did he, what did he just say? So it went from three months to, okay, six months. And then six months mark. Now it's a year, you know? And uh, you talk about a morale buster. It's one thing to get deployed somewhere and say, hey, you guys are going to be gone for two years. Or, right. right. Or you're going to be gone for six months, whatever the case is. And then, yeah, you know, it might get delayed a month or two. You know, that's that's one thing. But when somebody tells you three months and then somebody tells you six months and then that six months come almost to the day and then they say, oh, another six months. I'm like, what the fuck are you all doing up there? You know? Yeah. And what pissed me off about more than anything, it wasn't the fact that we we're going to be there for another six months, which that pissed me off, don't get me wrong, it was that dude who just left. They don't... They don't not tell an outgoing commander what's going on. Right. You know what I mean? Right. He knew damn well we were going to be there in our six months. And he sat up there and told everybody, I'll see you soon and everything. I mean, what kind of – it just goes to show you the kind of leadership that that was, you know. And that's why we went on that mission in the first place because he was spineless. And then he was spineless again when he sat there and lied to that whole brigade mm -hmm. right to their face. Mm -hmm. And then, and then he gets promoted to general. Yeah. Yeah. Can you believe that? So out of all the <clears throat> issues that we've all probably had from that deployment and many others like you've had, um, that's been the roughest thing for me to deal with. Um, it's not, yeah, getting shot at sucks, you know. My biggest, I wouldn't call it depression. It would, <laughs> I don't know what to call it. But my, my whole thing of that was the leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's been the roughest thing to deal with. Because mm -hmm. after that, I didn't trust anybody. I didn't want to have anything to do with the Army. Um, I did my time. I tried to not get myself in those situations ever again. I wasn't going to put my life in somebody, some irresponsible person's hands again to be able to make the decision on my life. Mm -hmm. And I know that's selfish. Um, and I feel bad for thinking that way sometimes. But then I think about it again. I'm like, no, nah, I don't feel selfish at all. Because you guys are the ones that put that dude in in, in charge. Yeah. So it's your all's fault, not mine. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you feel that way. <laughs> but I definitely do. And that was one of the biggest things that was never talked about. It was, I think it was touched on just a hair in that documentary that they went back and said, oh, yeah, the colonel said that, you know, your tapes will be scrutinized. Well, that was, what, a five-second clip of what happened. Right. But the whole story is that was the worst commander I've ever seen in my life, mm -hmm. ever, ever, in any unit. And mm -hmm. they promoted this dude to general. So I'm sure he retired. I'm sure he's making a bazillion dollars with Boeing or whoever. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where he's at. don't care. But um, I still have – I haven't talked about them. You can probably see my little frustration coming back, but uh, every time I think about that, it just gets me all fired up again. Well, I'll tell you this. I saw day and night difference on my second deployment than I did on my first yeah. with the leadership. Hmm. And I think the rules of engagement were even tighter. Oh, absolutely. Were. When, on the yeah. second deployment, and uh, it was day and night different. There were still engagements. There were still... I mean, they were scrutinized, but uh, I think, you know, if it was a tie, the tie always went to the to the fighter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I'll still never forgive him. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, he's the one that set, set me in motion to uh, retire as, as quick as I could. And um, I, I, I felt guilty a lot about it. But like I said, you go back and think about it and you're like – you know what? I'm a pretty loyal person, I think, um, to friends and unit and even to jobs at, at some point. 
And when that's not reciprocated in that case, then, you know, see ya. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's my whole <laughs> spew on the whole Iraq thing. Yeah. So uh, you've done a lot of other things since then. So you went and uh, you did some fixed wing stuff. I did. Um, some some Intel stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much you want to talk about. I don't, I don't think any of that stuff classified now. It probably was when you were doing it. But. It, it was it was pretty simple. Uh, while I was, this is a terrible thing. While we were at Balad, Ron Thompson decided he was going to put in a fixed wing packet, and I was busy, you know, being an SP and in the unit and trying to get everything done and carl schoenwald was he was the sp of one of the other troops and i said ron what while you're putting your packet in would you just duplicate everything and and me and carl will put our information in and we'll send ours with yours and uh he did he was nice enough to do that brought us the packet all we had to do was fill out submit and uh when it all came back Carl and I had got selected for the fixed wing course and Ron didn't. Mm. And I felt horrible. So with that story, you really need to go back and watch Mike Barnwell's podcast. It'll be dead. Yeah. And I'm going to put that out there and go ahead. But uh, so when we got back, and I want to make sure I got my timeline correct, uh, I believe we went to the fixed wing course, went back to Rucker, and we were flying... We were both attached. He went somewhere up in up north, and I went back to Rucker, and I was attached to a National Guard unit. Uh, I'm, I take that back. It was Army Reserve unit, um, flying VIPs, and I flew VIPs all over the eastern coast. And then, uh, we didn't go out. We didn't go west very much at all. But it was all in the east you know dc virginia you know those kind of places and we did that until they were started developing what they call what was called task force odin which was an intelligence aircraft um that had some really swoopy stuff on it and i've never never heard that military term what's what's that what's a swifty or swifty it's just (laughs) cool technology you know and uh had to go to maryland while they were building this thing and while they were building it then we did the test on it as it came off the assembly and all they did was they took c12 r's and r1s and modified them and they put all this intel stuff in the back and so then we got deployed to uh iraq again and we had a FLIR ball on the bottom and some cameras and that kind of things. And we had an operator in the back. And then we generally have some guy from a no-name unit that was that rode with us. And he was taking in all the current intel as well as what was passed back. And that was a six-month rotation for me. Uh, it was kind of funny because none of the reserve guys wanted to go. Just me and one other guy, and we were both active duty. The two active duty guys volunteered to go. So we went, and like I said, we flew up in, it was Hagerstown, Maryland, where they were developing the aircraft and making all the mods to it. And we went up there and stayed up there, it seemed like forever, and uh, then deployed. And we flew that mission for six, I did it for six months, and then I came back Mm. and... uh, I had, had a pretty good time doing that. But when I came back, I went back to Hood, and I ended up in uh, 4th ID. And that led to my next deployment in Iraq with 4th ID, mm. which was totally different than than uh, the first one. No. Yeah. And uh, got that rotation over with and uh, came back and— I was asking, you know, look, I've done two pretty much back-to-back rotations because I did that six-month rotation, and then it wasn't long. And they pulled me out of fixed wing, put me back in Apaches. I said, "Look, you you got to throw me a bone here, <laughs> you know." And uh, I said, "Well, where do you want to go?" And who's the career dude at that time? I think it was Reyes. Reyes, I think it was Angel. Angel. Yeah, go ahead. and uh, I think I don't. I'm 
I wouldn't swear. I can't remember who was after him. Yeah. But anyway. So I said, well, look, I I had been to Kwajalein Atoll somewhere in in this breakup of time. My wife and I went out to Kwajalein Atoll as a guest from Steve Bass, who was another attack pilot that I knew and I was good friends with. We went to visit him. He was like, dude, I'm getting ready to leave. You need to see if you can't get this assignment. And so, you know, I talked to, uh, I guess it was Angel, and I said, look, I need to, I want that assignment. He goes, well, I can't. He said, you, you got to be a safety officer. You got to go to COR school. You got to go to GFR school and you got to get an LUH transition. And I don't, I can't get all those schools lined up back to back. I said, I tell you what, you sit on that for a minute. Let me do some investigating. So I pulled out an Excel spreadsheet. I started looking up schools and dates and all that kind of stuff. And I figured out four courses of action to where I could do all those schools and take leave in between. Did that, did that ever, did that ever leave a gap between Steve leaving and you getting there? Um, like maybe a day or two. Oh, okay. It wasn't much. Yeah. Um, so then I went out to Kwajalein Atoll for two years and flying LUHs. We had the only Coast Guard orange LUHs in the Army out there. And uh, that place is a test Wait, site. Weren't you the commander out there or the? I was the aviation government, aviation representative okay. out there. And uh, basically there were 18 military people out there and all they did was oversee the civilian contract but since i was an aviator i flew and i oversaw the aviation contract as well okay they had hueys when i first got there and it wasn't i don't want to say like a month or two and then they got luhs we got four of them what do you think about luhs that's a pretty nice aircraft (laughs) it's a twin engine yeah so that's good yeah um it's a little finicky um i got a family member who works on them yeah. And he tells me all the horror stories, so oh, really? I just wonder how much of what he says translates to somebody's flying them. Well, I know that we had, we were on a 1.2 mile, square mile island <laughs> that's surrounded by salt water. Right. So out there, plastic would rust if it was left outside long enough. Yeah. So our maintenance on those aircraft was incredible because you'd go fly and you'd have to wash it, grease it do whatever they did to it, put it up, make sure it was covered. You pull it out the next morning, go fly it again. Mm -hmm. And what we were doing, we were transporting workers because there's several different islands out there that have radar sites and they have generators and uh, water and all those kind of things that have to be, you know, have maintenance on them. So you take them out there, drop them off for the day, they do their maintenance, and then you go pick them up in the afternoons. Mm -hmm. And uh, That seems like a pretty cool assignment. But, you know, I was stationed in Hawaii, and that was a lot bigger than where you were at. Mm-hmm. And after about a year, year and a half, you're like, man, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I well, couldn't imagine. That, was that a two-year? It was or, two, years, two years, and I didn't. I only got to go home once mm-hmm. in two years because I was the uh, the government flight representative. And it's a weird uh, relationship, but the commander, who's a colonel, couldn't approve a flight. Uh, it had to be the government flight representative that approved the flight. Mm-hmm. So there's only one yeah. on the island. Yeah. And he, and this particular commander, he's a good guy, but he was like, you can't leave. What happens if something, you know, something goes down and we need to launch an aircraft, you got to approve it and you can't do it by telephone. Yeah. And uh, so I finally managed to get someone from Huntsville uh, to come out there and he was a G, he was GFR trained as well, and we were able to sign over the authority to him, the, uh, the approval authority, while I went on leave. No. And so that's how I managed to get off the island. Um, but that contract out there is a cost plus contract, contract, and it just costs the U.S. taxpayer tons of money. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just one of those deals. Um, so I did that for two years, and, and I was I was pretty close to retirement. I was getting ready to retire. I was actually considering putting my my packet in because I really didn't want to go anywhere else. You know, I'd been to the major hubs. Apaches are only at the big bases, and and uh, so I was really considering retirement, and I get a call from, from uh, Lonnie Hibbard, and he's like, I need you to 
need you to come back with me to one AD cab and go to Afghanistan with me. And uh, I said, well, sir, you know, I'm pretty much going to retire. <laughs> he said, come on, just one more time. And I said, uh, and he was, he was a uh, exec in, uh, when I was with four, four and super good dude, really great commander when he was a commander. And, uh, I said, okay. So uh, that's how I ended up back at, back in El Paso mm. because that's where one AD cap was. Yeah. And, uh, then I got lucky to lucky enough to go to Afghanistan in a task force, which was kind of weird because I thought the whole unit was going. That's why I was going. Yeah. But it was just a task force, and I got selected to go with so the task did, force. Did Hubbard go with you? Hubbard did not go with me <laughs> <laughs> after all that. And you ain't got nothing to say? You ain't got nothing to say about that? Well, I, he's a great guy. Let it out, man. Come you on. Know, <laughs> he's, he's a great guy, and, and we're still friends today. We still hunt together. Well, and, who understand? I'm, I'm never going to let him live it down, that's for well, sure. Who understand? You know? Tell him right now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, okay. So Afghanistan, you said, you know, it was night and day from, you know, you would think, hey, the same area, you know, same mm -hmm. general area, kind of. Yeah. We're going to be much different. You got bad guys in both areas. The, uh, but you describe it as two totally different. Two totally different theaters. In my mind, the, the, uh, the terrain was much more unforgiving, much more mountainous, high altitudes. We had one base that we flew up to that was, you know, 9,500 feet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it took all we could do to get in there. And then once we got in there, we had to be really careful about how much fuel we had and how much ordnance once we got in there, because it, you, trying to get, you know, all the fobs had these wire baskets around them yep. and getting over the, the fence line there was tough mm -hmm. sometimes, you know. Um, I went with the task force from one AD cab that was made up mainly of Blackhawks and a, and a medic company. And we had got a, we fell into a National Guard Apache unit company that was part of the task force. And that was a How many aircraft were in the task force? Man, I couldn't tell you. No. Six? No, 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 no. More? There, there was a company. So, oh, so, so there, how does the company get attached to a guard unit? No, no, no. The, the guard unit was the company. Was the task force? No, no, no. The guard unit was a company that was within the task force. Gotcha. So okay. We, so we had a company of okay. eight Apaches gotcha. in the task force, and then we had a GSAB, uh, just general supply, whatever that stands for. And we had, it, it wasn't a battalion, it was another company. Um, and then we had a medevac company as well. And I think that was it. We were down in Shindan, down there in Afghanistan. And those those Afghans, they wanted to fight. They wouldn't shoot at you and run. Mm. They wanted to fight. They was like, kill me or I'm going to kill you kind of thing. Well, it's easy to be like that when you're all drugged up. Yeah, they were. <laughs> I mean, opium is their, their major crop yeah. there. And I'm sure every one of them was using it. Mm -hmm. You know. Was you using? No. No? No. Okay. Never got a chance. Sure. <laughs> Didn't get a chance. <laughs> Didn't get a chance. I'm sure there's plenty of opportunity. You yeah. Gotta... yeah. All right. So we go from Afghanistan, which I'm sure there's a lot more. We go in a whole episode with that. But um, coming back to the States, back to El Paso. Yep. And you're like, okay, I'm really done this time. Yeah. Before we even left Afghanistan, I put in my retirement paperwork. I had a little mm -hmm. medical issue and it was looking like I wasn't going to be able to fly anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's no way I'm going back to a desk job. And so when I went back to El Paso, I was still the SP there, but I was a non-flying SP um, just for about six months and, yeah. until I actually retired. So if you can't, if you're getting grounded, what are your job options when you're getting out? Well, it's kind of weird. The Army's a lot, they're a lot more, they scrutinize things a lot more in the medical world than the civilians. Mm -hmm. Took the same issue that I had and went to the FAA and they said, not a problem. You can pass a flight physical, an FAA flight yeah. physical. Uh, so I went and got a flight physical and uh, applied at one of the offshore companies, PHI. Got on with them and started flying offshore. I th yeah, that sounds good, and I've thought about that um, was when I was retiring, thinking about doing that. 
Uh, that sounds like a very challenging job. It was. As far as like the, I mean, weather is obviously very unpredictable. Yeah. And, the, and being out in the ocean, there's nowhere to land when you get <laughs> into it real deep. I qualified. They had this, I don't know what you call it, this biased against Apache pilots in the, in the, in the corporation. Mm -hmm. They thought we were only VFR pilots and that we couldn't fly instruments. Yeah. So when I applied for a job, I got accepted as a VFR pilot in a VFR aircraft, which was a Bell 407. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> had a GPS in it, but no other flight instruments. No, uh, I don't even think I had force trim, to be honest with you. I can't remember now, but I don't think I had force trim. Uh, I didn't have anything instrument-wise. It was strictly day VFR. And uh, so the they had other aircraft that were, you know, kitted out IFR to land on the platforms in low ceilings and visibility. Um, so as a VFR guy, uh, the weather was a big factor and it was unpredictable. And I would come in in the daytime, you know, and look at the weather and I might have an assignment to take four or five guys out to a platform or whatever the case may be. And you look at the weather between you and them, can't get out there. You know, you tell the boss man, hey, I can't, I can't get there. The weather's too bad. And he would just say, put the people in the aircraft and take them out there as far as you can. And then when you can't make it, turn around and come back. Because they're charging the customer every time the skids break the ground. Mm -hmm. And that, I could not do that with a clear conscience. That just did not set well with me. And being a type A guy trying to accomplish a submission, sometimes I'd fly a little further Pushing it too much. than what I needed to fly. And mm -hmm. I'd end up out there. I remember one particular day I was going outbound. The weather was crappy. And I'd looked at the weather and I said, well, at 6,000 feet, I think that's the ceilings I can get over the top. And I get up over the top and I'm flying out there and I get to the platform and guess what? I can't get down. There's no hole. There's nothing to go through. I turn around and come back. Well, guess what? Airfield socked. Mm. Now I'm really looking for something. And luckily I found a little bitty hole. And I was able to get down through it and get back on the ground. And once I did that, I said, I'm not doing this no more. No. That's it. I'm done. Mm. So. <clears throat> so being retired for how long have you been retired now? I retired uh, from the Army in 14. And then I flew another year and a half or so. So mm. 15, 16. So being retired, I mean, I've been retired, but I'm still working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. But you have to have some kind of hobbies, I think, to keep yourself sane. And you got quite the setup here. I do. So you got a pretty, <clears throat> I don't even know if you call it a hobby. I mean, it's, I guess it's called a hobby. It's more of a mm, sport, maybe? maybe? Is that what you call it? No. Uh, we have six labs, and we, uh, we do field trials and hunt tests, and we play a little game called the SRS. And you Google that and look at it on YouTube. It's kind of cool. Mm. Uh, and, uh, I have a pro trainer and I go out to the pros kennel about three days a week and train with the pro. And, uh, then I run my dogs and get to take them to these different competitions and run as an amateur. Uh, the pro trainer of course runs as a pro. So do a little bit of that. And, um, uh, I reload. I also do competitive shooting. It's called uh, black powder rifle cartridge. Um, if you're familiar with Quigley Down Under, if you've ever watched mm. that movie, he had a rifle that he shot, and I have the exact duplicate of that rifle, and that's what we shoot in competition. Mm. Travel all over the place doing that. Same with the dogs. Travel mm. all over the place, you know. Well, I want to touch a little bit on the dog thing <clears throat> because there's, a, I think, a misconception about not so much that sport but how dogs are treated. <clears throat> you know, some people see – those crates in the back of trucks and got the dogs all cramped up and mm -hmm. people are, man, why, you know, mistreating them dogs, whatever. Well, I can attest I've seen your setup mm -hmm. and on the outside, you're like, oh, them poor dogs. But when you realize what, what it is, those guys, live, <laughs> those dogs live better than we do. They do. Um, I've got a three hole box on my truck, which means I can hold three dogs. 
Uh, it's an insulated box, uh, top, bottom, and sides. It can be 100 degrees outside, and inside that box, it'll be 10 degrees cooler. Mm. Um, it's got gravity-fed water, pump-fed water. It has uh, an exhaust fan as well, kind of like you have over your stove or whatever that pulls the hot air out. Mm. I also have an air conditioner that I can, it's a portable one that I can slide in there and air condition them. Um, and then I can also put a, a shop light in there and actually heat them in the winter. Um, dogs, their body heat, their temperatures are about 101 degrees. So if you put three of them in there, they keep each other warm, yeah. you know, uh, but still we don't take them out when it's like frigid, sure. you know, um, and same with the summer. The summers are the worst when it gets really hot. You got to really be careful. We train early in the morning. We don't train a long time. Mm. And you can't train a dog a long time. Dog has an attention span of about 15 minutes. And if you go much over that, you're not going to, you're not accomplishing anything. Mm. You know, um, so we train pretty early in the morning, train quick. And uh, we just, it, and it's all repetition, you know. That's the way dogs learn. They don't learn so much from using an e-collar or something like that. They learn some from that, but it's repetition, repetition, repetition. Yeah. You know? And that's what we do. Well, I think it's pretty cool. <clears throat> like we we talked about before on one of the breaks, you know, I had a black lab that, yeah, you can teach a dog, but there are certain dogs that have its own, you know, it's an automatic instinct that if you train them, it can make, make them even better. I had a dog that... And we sit, <laughs> give me your paw, and that's that's about it. And I would bring that dog out into the woods, and whichever way I was pointing, he would go back and forth. And I didn't even think he would be looking at me, but as soon as I would turn, he would dart out in front of me and start doing. What do you call it? Quartering. Quartering. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even know what it was, but you know that dog's trying to teach. He's, He's, He's teaching hunting. me. Yeah. He's like, hey, what are you yeah. doing, dude? <laughs> yeah. so, that's pretty cool. Well, and that's why we use Labradors. Labradors were were bred. They were, they were developed to be retrievers in the water. And there's other dogs that are the same too. But in my opinion, a Labrador is the best dog for the job. Yeah. You know, and it's it's just inherent for them to retrieve. Yeah, and you you said you have a champ, one of the champion dogs, or you went to the championship. I went to. Uh, so every year there's there's two competitions. There's the master amateur, which mm -hmm. only amateurs run their dogs in, and we've managed to pass that two years in a row, um, or one year, I'm sorry. And then there's the master national, which is made up of pros and amateurs. And my two two of my competition dogs have passed that twice now, and we get one more pass on those two, and they'll go into the Hall of Fame. Mm. So we're, that's what we're shooting for. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Especially for you. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Yeah, anything, uh, you know, anything I've noticed about you, I mean, you always put your heart and soul to whatever you're doing. So if Charlie's doing something, more than likely he's doing a good job at it. So um, is there anything I've not brought up or brought up that you want to talk about? Because this is going to be the end, but I want to give you the opportunity to call me an asshole or talk about something no. that, you, that we haven't brought up. Or No, I'm happy you came. I, I'm work static that you even let us. Yeah. Um, I know getting a call out of the blue. I think I talked to you a couple months before that, mm -hmm. but it was very brief. Right. <laughs> I called you, and I, after like a minute or two, I was like, "I, I got to go" because some it was a work thing that I had going on. Right, you know, work comes got to come first. You know, right. you get fired. So, um, yeah, man, thanks, thanks for having. It. it was a good drive out here. Hopefully, uh, you guys see some of the footage on our adventure out here. And possibly on the way back. Um, but if you ain't got nothing else, man, we're going to end it right here. I don't really have anything else. Like I said, I'm glad glad you came out. I'm happy to do this. I really would like to see the troop get back together again just one time. Yeah, that would be kind of hard to do. Yeah, it um, is. It would be a challenge. But I would be totally up for it. Yeah. Um, I think we got to get everybody retired first. <laughs> True. Believe it or not, we still got to get, well, you said he just retired. Yeah. <clears throat> so the... Man, can you think of anybody else that's – we'll do some of that research on our own. But, um, oh, can't announce anything officially, but me and you might be taking a trip. Maybe. Maybe. It's, it's probably going to be three or four or five months. But um, you're going to be part of our road trip. Probably, I don't know, 
it'll be next season, but <clears throat> it might be within the next four or five months or so. But until then, guys, thanks for watching, and uh, you know, hit all the little buttons, and uh, we'll see you later.